Thank you very much from JFK there for joining us. The Sun King himself <laughs> giving us a great introduction there. <laughs> and uh, good evening everybody, welcome to the Tech One Radio Lounge. Um, hopefully we're going to be bringing on Kevin Annett in hopefully in about half an hour time. See, but unfortunately these things never go smoothly. Yeah, so, we're having um, some technical difficulties. But, um, <laughs> we could just say hello to uh, energy J, to Caroline, Gorda, Rose and to Reset. Hi, hi, guys. Rose Goyden. Hello. <laughs> hey, guys. Glad to be here. I think Kevin's going to be hi. great. So cool. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah cool. can't wait. This is that is so cool. I yeah. just I just sent out a bulletin to everybody on Friends of Freeman and a big note on Facebook. Let everybody know because, man, he's awesome. Yeah. He's great, yeah. He is, and he's got some great information and some great... Um, I thought, did Sonic talk, Sonic talk on his trip? I thought he was going on, right? He, yeah, yeah, he he's is. Gone. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's not with us tonight, but he's with us in spirit, and he'll be. Um, I'm, just... I'm sure he'll well, listen in at some point afterwards. Yeah. So we'll say a shout out to Sonic, and we miss you. <laughs> Hope you're having always, a great time. He's always irreplaceable. He is. Yeah, absolutely, I know. Absolutely. We're having a few yeah. difficulties here, but hopefully, like I say, we should be able to get Kevin, um, Kevin on uh, at some point. Um, until then, maybe uh, we can catch up on a few things uh, going on. Um, I, th this week on uh, the radio in this country, over here in England, there was an interesting show on the radio, on kind of a sort of sensible radio uh, channel that does kind of in-depth interviews and um, documentary type pieces uh, called Radio 4. And they were doing a half-hour piece on fracking, interestingly enough. So, of course, when, when I was in the car driving along and I put the radio on and this, I, I, uh, this was on, and I thought, hmm, that's interesting, talking about fracking. And, well, the whole show was really just a big advert for fracking uh, in a promotional sense. And there was no, that you know, they mentioned a little bit about... Um, the earthquake thing, but again, like I've heard before on other interviews where they spoke about fracking, they played down the fact that it can cause earthquakes, especially in this country. They were just talking about in this country. They didn't, and there was no kind of mention of the pollution of water. They had farmers on there talking about how um, it, had, it had taken up very little space on their land, not like having a great big oil rig having to dig into the ground or anything like this. And they were, you know, really promoting it in a big way, and uh, so I found that quite disturbing, actually, to hear the way that they they're really pushing it in this country. No mention of the water pollution and the court cases and the payouts that have come through America and Canada and various other countries. Uh, no mention at all about this. It's just it was being promoted as a, a green, a new green um, type of, uh, well, not exactly green, but low carbon is what they're saying, you know. Uh, and, yeah, it's just getting a really good kind of advertising campaign in this country. And I remember Dudeface saying a few weeks ago that somewhere in Canada, I can't remember where it was he said now, but they're setting up, the gas company is setting up a whole city virtually. Um, they're preparing housing for the workers and shops and, you know, everything that uh, 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 an organization and a, an operation like that will need. Um, they're setting this all up because they're going to start doing these big fracking uh, campaigns in Canada as well. Where there are, I mean, Canada is resource heavy, isn't it? There's so, so much... Um, so many natural resources in Canada that um, this is exactly why they, that, I mean really they don't even need to do fracking there because there's so much oil and everything there that they they don't necessarily need to be doing that but there we go, they just want to ruin the land and ruin the water table don't they for some reason or other just to completely, completely fuck things up so 
So that's what's been happening. Mm-hmm. That's, the, that's the news on fracking mm-hmm. in this country. Rather frightening. And hopefully when Kevin comes on, um, we can talk a little bit about, uh, about these kind of subjects because this, this is, uh, although fracking and native uh, populations might not seem like something that might necessarily mix together, but this is, they're, they're very intrinsically linked um, because this is why the native peoples were cleared from their lands because the corporation wanted to take over the lands and just not only rape the people but rape the land as well and um, take everything mm. that that the land, all the beauty that the land provided. So how are things going there, Steve? Any luck with Kevin? Uh, not, not yet. We'd, I, I will say, though, that actually Kevin isn't scheduled his end to come on until uh, for another hour, for, another hour, yeah, for an hour yeah. into the show. So to be fair... <laughs> it but we, we have been hearing him talking about um, he's in a room with someone who's uh, not set his computer up by the sounds of it. But yeah. he is online, so fingers crossed he'll be ready by for the time being. Yeah. So any other any other news? Any uh, news from anyone uh, out there? there? What's been going well, on? In I'm, I'm so I'm oh. sending that package to you. Your your uh, a Christmas package. Yeah. Yay! Yeah. Thanks, James. <laughs> your buddy Christmas. Yeah. Hey, um, <laughs> did you see the lunar eclipse? Anybody? No, I haven't. But I heard a lot about the stuff that's happening in yeah. um, December twenty second. Tell us a bit about that, Jay. Okay, uh, during the uh, solstice, yeah. we're going to be getting uh, basically a lot of burst solar flares and stuff that are basically dealing with information, dealing with the, the collective of the entire solar system. What, what, just one second, and, Jay. Um, We've got a caller, one area code one one one. All the ones. Eleven eleven. Yes, Swami. Yes, Swami. We're just getting some, we're just getting some <laughs> wow, information about that. Was a nice greeting. <laughs> <laughs> That's because we love you. We love you. <laughs> Last time I, I greeted that way was when I went to pay off the loan at the bank. <laughs> Well, Swami, may I offer all the love and light that's in my heart for to you right now, but right now we've got Jay telling us about things that are happening on the solstice. Would you want to continue, Jay? Okay, the sun, sun acts like a metronome for the solar system. And this, these solar flares are basically information packets. And what they're doing is reprogramming our bodies. And during this one coming up will be affecting us on that will affect us in such a way that we'll be able to connect our um, subconscious connective collective to the collective of the whole solar system, which means we'll have more information about solar activities uh, in the next few months being mainstream so to speak um, come come to the summer solstice my information services have told me that then we're going to get a, a bunch of solar activity that is going to give us information about the galactic consciousness and and the collective of the galactic of a galactic nature, so we're going to learn about the other groups and entities that live within our galactic plane of existence. Wow. When we come to December 22nd, 2012, is when the universal energy hits, and the sun is going to relate that to us, and we're going to get the universal collective or all all the rest of the collective is going to enter into us where we will become aware of the entire universe. Mm-hmm. This don't mean we'll be at 5D at that time, 
but it will mean we'll be well on our way. Yeah. And we'll be racing. We'll have a number of time shifts in between, in between times, as we reach different lev- levels of energy. We'll shift in frequency, and right now we're in, we're actually in an astral, astral plane. So a lot of uh, memories of past lives and stuff like that will get easier because you're in more of a now moment. And you can go to any other now moment, like in a past life, and it'll seem very much alive because mm. they're happening simultaneously on different streams. Mm. Wow. wow. That sounds like an interesting new that year does, coming that's up. It's going to be a great new year next year. <laughs> so, hi, Swami. You had a fantastic show last week with Mr. Freighter X, didn't you? Oh, I enjoyed it. I, I hope. I hope ah, the listeners it got something out of it. Uh, <clears throat> there were some bits in it that just made me laugh out loud, and some bits that, you know the bit, <clears throat> excuse me, the bits when you were talking about nearly crying, or just crying. Oh, yeah. That, 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 I get that all the time, man. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of us who do. I mean, yeah. like I said, in, in the Indian culture, a bhakta, which is what one of us who, who has this, reaction to devotional energy that is inspired and just arises of its own. Sometimes it's got an obvious trigger and sometimes it's more subtle. But Mm -hmm. these people are considered saintly because they have this direct connection through the physical body with the divine bliss Mm -hmm. of truth. You know, and mm-hmm. now there are also <laughs> there are also fakers in India who take some uh, uh, what's called tiger balm and they rub it under their eyes so they can then have these tears streaming as they talk to God and you know, but they're they're fake quite obviously. But but those of us who genuinely experience this, but don't really have any any uh, frame of reference to put it in uh, are, are actually very very blessed souls to to just experience that so mm-hmm. it's I mean <laughs> after a lifetime of being embarrassed about it 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 was nice to find out hey this is a good thing in some places <laughs> yeah big yeah. boys do cry it's okay <laughs> And you know, I'm sure it. Well, we know it. it it's got a health-giving um, quality to it as well, because you're releasing these things. If you sti- if you're stifling your emotions, you're suppressing something, and um, suppressing things is what can lead to um, upsets in the body, disharmonies. Yeah, it's like a press. It's like a pressure valve, isn't it? When you start crying. Yeah. Stop okay, what you hear? I can't hear anybody. Oh. Ah, is Kevin. that Kevin? Ah, right. We're going to go and take a little break because yeah. we're trying to bring Kevin in, and we're having a little little trouble there. So um, we're just going to try and get to a bit of music here. Put the um, put the bugger on. Prince here. And we're back. (laughs) Hello, we're back. (laughs) Sorry about that. We crashed there. That was a bit unfortunate. We're still trying to get hold of um, Kevin. And still having problems there. Um, We need to send that Skype thing to him, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Okay, will you just send it on my email? Yeah, well, Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, is everyone there still? Swami, you still there? Yep, 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 yep. Reset, you still there? I am. Okay, Carolyn? And Carolyn's <laughs> gone, okay. <laughs> Isn't it always the same? No. <laughs> well, there we go. Te- technical di- it wouldn't be the same without the technical difficulties, would it? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Just like life. <laughs> Mercury retrograde. <laughs> well, you know, all the all the sunspot activity is only going to make things worse, isn't it? 
Perhaps we'll lose well, it's more just content. It's just going to reset your uh, programming a little bit, but actually it'll come out better. It'll be upgrading your programming. That's it. Yeah, we, we probably won't need all this kind of type 1 communication because we'll just, mm. we'll be type 1 ourselves. <laughs> okay. Hey, are you guys hearing me at all? Yeah, we're hearing, hearing you now, Caroline. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, I just, somehow I disappeared, but that's okay. cool. I called back in on Skype. I didn't know if you were bringing people in or if we were just calling well, in. We probably won't need to oh, we've got that echo now, haven't we? <laughs> oh, 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 dear. <laughs> Uh, we've still actually got Kevin on the line, but he doesn't know. I don't think he's got any speakers. That's We're not quite problem. sure what's happening at his end mm. because he's on. Um, he's gone somewhere to use a Skype facility at a college or something somewhere, and they obviously haven't provided um, the right sort of uh, uh, technology for him to to get in touch. So we just trying to set we were trying to kind of um link him into yeah, the show uh, through the Skype thing but I think we're just gonna get him to try and Skype into the show one way or another. <laughs> or if you use call ID you can call call that uh, individual phone. Yeah and we just add it to the conversation. Yeah. We we can't do that unfortunately. We can't do that unfortunately. For some reason, I can try to send him a note on Facebook and see if he can read it, tell him what to do if you want. No, uh, it's okay. We've got him up on email. We've got, got on email. We're, we're in communication through okay. email. So, but he doesn't seem to even be getting the messages on Skype. So, yeah, I don't on, know why. If he's on Skype, he's not getting. You know, when the Skype messages go through and they have a little circular thing going around, yeah. them up. Yeah, so. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. Steve just tried to, to call yeah. me. I guess he's not sure how to get... He must be trying to log in or have somebody pick him up. Maybe he doesn't know. Go to the blog talk page and you'll see a little bitty S up there where it says phone in. Steve, just go ahead and hit that button, I guess. We got what? some questions by Jay bringing us all in. Hey. Say that again, Carl? Yep. Uh, Steve just tried to call me. Steve sign guy. On oh, Skype, right. I think he's trying to figure out. I think some people don't know that because Jay spoiled us by doing a conference call over Skype a couple times. But yeah. if, without doing that, everybody you dial in or go to that blog talk page and you'll see the little blue ask oh. for Skype and go ahead and just click on that and Skype will connect you directly. Yeah. Okay, there we go. I'll just give out the blog talk number while we're here as well, which is 347 205. Nine six five seven. So if anybody wants to call in, then that's the number you can get in touch with us on. Um, while we're while we're still kind of going through the technical difficulties, um, there is something. Uh, I just thought I just got something. I thought you might like to have a little chat about, which is um, a, a guy called. Has anyone heard of a guy called Rami Nagel? No, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well, Rami Nagel, he um, he he talks about. Uh, he's written a book called um, How to Prevent Tooth Decay, and it, it, it's an interesting book because uh, a, a lot of what he bases his work on is the work of a dentist called Western H. Price. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Western H. Price, um, who was actually a Canadian. And his studies into uh, he he was um, he studied the uh, various cultures. Uh, it, this was in the 1930s. He travelled the world and studied various cultures. Um, and he he published uh, work on nutrition and uh, physical. Uh, deterioration and various things like TB and that um, and, and he was looking at indigenous populations and why they had such incredibly beautiful teeth compared to Western populations and it, what his 
um, findings came up with were that um, in the the introduction of like refined sugars and flours into Western um, diets were one of the causes of um, tooth decay, and that unlike uh, we we have a notion that you know if well if you eat sweet things it's going to make your teeth go bad. It, well, it's not so much that the sweet things make your teeth go bad. It's that um, your when your body has a high level of sugar within it, uh, it can't produce the um, vitamins and minerals that it needs to keep a healthy body um, and to prevent certain types of um, infection within the body. So. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, his work with indigenous populations kind of showed how important their knowledge was, just as things like food knowledge, um, which I thought was quite interesting because it links into the work that um, Kevin does with indigenous populations and how it's just simple things like this, the simple knowledge um, of the, just the way that the native people, the indigenous peoples of the world were eating and their whole diet was in balance with with keeping your your body in in balance so you know you weren't eating big macs and um kfc and things like this because that, that's just not natural food it's just i mean okay it's a piece of chicken and you might say a chicken is natural but what they're doing with it isn't natural and the additives that they're putting in mcdonald's to preserve them for well, God knows how long. They're almost embalming that food before you eat it. So uh, there, there was a program on TV in this country the other day, um, and it's called something like, Help My Child's Eating Themselves to Death. And it was about these young girls who were only about 14 years old, and they had obesity problems at this age. You know, they weighed like 14 stone, and they were 14 years old. And... Uh, they, um, these girls of this age were going in to have gastric band operations. Do you know what they are? Where they kind of, uh, they, it's a major operation and you can, it's very likely you can die from this. Mm. They clamp and, the stomach uh, basically. Yeah, they, clamp, they make the right. stomach smaller. Hi, Azoth. Azoth has just turned up here. And, uh, and they, were try they were giving these operations to 14-year-old girls. And the the thing that was the thing that really got me was that that well for a start they were saying <laughs> that um, they've been trying to lose weight for six months. Well, you know, if you're trying to lose weight for six months, you, it might take a little bit longer than that actually to really get into the, the diet. And thank you oh. for the lovely music. <laughs> technician at the college is gone and I can't get on unless I go home which is something I can't do because the car's not here so I don't know if people want me to uh, make a statement on the air or if somebody would email me and let me know what you'd like me to do I'll wait to hear on email okay we're just sending <laughs> Kevin an email this is going to be bizarre isn't this is it <laughs> So we just sent him an email to say that we can hear him, and so he'll probably <laughs> chime in with that lovely music at any minute. Now that was Caroline. <laughs> oh, was that you, Caroline? Caroline. All oh, right. <laughs> okay. So when he gets that email, Kevin will will. Will chime in with us again, but anyway. So they gave these girls these operations, um, and uh, afterwards, to celebrate, they went out and got um, chicken McNuggets, or no, what was it? It was KFC. <laughs> and guess what they did for the girl who had the gastric band operation because she couldn't stop eating crap? <laughs> they blended it 
in a blender no, and no, gave it to no, her blended. No, no. Wasn't that nice of them? No. <laughs> 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 Look, can, can, was it just me, but the irony there was hey, just uh, too much. I think we're back up. <laughs> Hey, I've got about five other people from Friends of Freeman that hooked me up on a conference call. Gene and, and Steve, the sign guy, and uh, yeah. they're trying to figure out how to how to get on. So I was trying to tell them. So I'll hang on okay. to the call, and I'm going to go you over can and Skype tell them. In. Okay, guys, you can Skype in on 347-205-9000. We don't put any music on at the moment in case Kevin uh, gets our message and um, chimes back in yeah, again. Yeah, he's going to do that. Um, but yeah, the uh, so so here we here we have kids, you know, fourteen-year-old kids having operations that could kill them, and their parents are still feeding them We're crap the after now. they've had the operation. Yeah, here, he comes. here comes Kevin. Are we on the show? Oh, yeah. hi, Gene. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me on, guys. Because uh, I was uh, I was at work working on the tech issue, and it, it uh, a good little break. Oh, yeah. Hey, we got everybody now. There we go. Hey. Was that Jay's magic that did that? Yes. You're a watch. Yeah, I told you. And Jay, right? Yeah, he's the miracle worker man. He does it all. Uh, this guy, 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 ought to get it. He ought to be hired by the phone company. Fuck. Yeah, I'm back. So you're, you're I, on Jay's. You're on Jay's line then, yeah? Yes. Uh, okay, right. They're right. on my line. They get mixed up and they started their own conference on a different line. So okay. I yeah, oh, okay. So they're all together. Oh, on that okay. One. Well, I'm. I'm gonna mute. If Kevin's talking, I'm gonna mute you. Okay. So. What he's going to do is he can't hear us, but but we can hear his voice. So he's going to he's going to make a statement on the um, on line one to get our email to saying that he's going to do that. Yeah. Hi, guy. Okay. That's so fair. Cool. <laughs> you hear that, Jay? Yeah, I'm on. I said hello, Jay. How, how are you doing? Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hello. Kevin. <coughs> Kevin, can you hear us? Hi, Kevin. Kevin. Kevin's just skyped in the show, so... <laughs> I hope, but if he hasn't got any headphones <laughs> yeah. for his computer, yeah. then... This, this is the thing, he just emailed us saying that um, he doesn't have any um, headphones for his computer and the technician at the college has gone home now. So... <laughs> uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of echo. Okay. Um, How's that? Uh-oh, echo. Kevin. 
Kevin, are you hearing him? He's gone. He's, he's dropped over. Oh, right. Go to call in again. <laughs> Carolyn's <laughs> background music there. <laughs> Anyway, guys, we're back up, so um, I'm going to try and add them again, and hopefully this will work. How's that going to work now? Well, because he hung up. So. Kevin, are you here? Yeah. Kevin. Kevin. Yes. Hey. Right, okay, you're on a you're on a, a strong cloud now, so just leave it as it is. Yeah. Has the echo gone? He's back on there now. Oh, I check. Up. Adjust your volume a little bit. That it should cut out the echo. Are we in a video game arcade? <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to drop the order. Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> oh, this is uh, a bit much. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I do. I do apologise for all this <laughs> to all our listeners. <laughs> our engineer. Mm. <laughs> An engineer goes away for one night and what happens? <laughs> we'll try and get him back here. Yeah. It's it's busy. Poor old Kevin, he's not <laughs> he's not some he's not a slack guy. I mean he's busy he's up to his eyes with things. We've got an echo. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Right. That's a good note, right. Please okay. go ahead and make a full say. <laughs> Please say something. <laughs> Please say something brilliant, which you know you will. I don't know if I can do anything brilliant at the moment, but uh, you can hear me okay. Yeah, 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 we can hear you, yeah. I expect you okay, perhaps you want to swear at the technicians from the college there. <laughs> oh, this is crazy. Anyway, when do you want to do the show? When right now. Right now. Isn't it right now? <laughs> <laughs> You're on it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're on. We have listeners. We have callers. <laughs> hey guys, that's great. Are you okay? Hey guys, you, hey, you guys, you guys mind if I can, uh, if I bring uh, uh, DL? He's uh, uh, one of the guys uh, on uh, with Metasabian, and uh, he, he can he can jump on as well. Too. Is that cool? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Okay. 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 Fine. Okay, Kevin. Yeah. Okay, Kevin, it's great to speak to you again. And uh, I understand in Canada there you've been uh, very busy and uh, you've come up with, uh, with quite some discoveries there. Perhaps you'd like to explain a little bit about uh, what's been going on in Canada. I'll just, I think most people who are listening ha have an understanding of uh, where you're coming from in that you were a, a minister of the, was it the United Reformed Church in Canada? that you began to expose um, crimes against the uh, indigenous Canadian people. You were thrown out of the church, um, and everything has snowballed from then. Um, you, you discovered that the uh, that you were being told of crimes committed by the church on the indigenous people, which included murders of the young children at the um, residential schools. Um, well, they were called yep. residential schools, but um, I've heard you term them as in, uh, name them as internment camps. Perhaps you'd like to just uh, take sure. it from there and explain what's been happening. Well, I wanted to say hi to everybody first, and, and all of you in Brighton. And it's been a few months since I was there, but I've, <laughs> I've got a lot of fond memories of all you folks. So thank you. Um, it, it's good to be on the air again with you. Um, we over the last couple of months in Brantford, Ontario. We've been excavating at the site of the oldest Indian boarding school in Canada. This was set up by the Church of England in the 1830s. It went into the 1970s. And we were digging right about 50 yards from the school in a mass grave site. On November 21st, we actually uncovered human bones. We had them analyzed, 
and it turns out that one of them is definitely the femur of a young girl, uh, about five or six years old. So this is historic. This is the first time in Canada that any bones have been identified as human coming out of a residential school grave. And it's really, um, it's been shattering for a lot of us, I mean, emotionally and in a lot of ways. I mean, we finally have the proof in our hands that children died in these schools. So, you know, it, it's really important uh, that the world learn about this. And so we're actually commencing in the new year a full-scale archaeological dig at the school. And it's, it's symbolic. It was the first school set up by the Crown of England in Canada, along with the Vatican. And uh, as people probably know, if they read our websites, about 50,000 more children died. So this is really, it changes everything. Now it's a definite crime site. And these churches, um, you know, are definitely going to have to be put on trial for what they did. And in the case of the Church of England, of course, we're talking about the Queen and, um, and the Pope, uh, who sh legally she's, she's liable to. Uh, the, the, the Vatican and the Crown of England are the two main actors in this genocide. So um, it's, it's really personally gratifying, you know, as horrible as to find there is remains, it's gratifying that at least we're on to the final stage of finding this forensic proof. And people can follow this. Um, our tribunal website is itccs.org. We post things regularly right there. And hiddennolonger.com has a lot of the evidence of, of you know, these crimes that, that occurred in these, these internment camps. And uh, for well, the um, although you've been highlighting uh, what what went on at these places, and uh, many of the native people have themselves been um, telling the, uh, the their their truth of what happened at these places, they've never been listened to, have they? And the the authorities have never actually uh, done anything to look into uh, these crimes, and it's it's taken all these years, and you yourself to actually help bring this about the authorities have never actually said oh yes let's let, we'll do a dig we'll have a look if you're telling the truth we'll 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 look into this oh yeah quite the opposite the the Royal Canadian amount of police who were a, an actor in these schools they were the ones who, who gathered up the kids and brought them into the, the, these camps um, they refused to investigate for ever since 1996 when I first began to investigate this the police have consistently refused to go to grave sites to investigate allegations of murders. And even now with the government, when they were forced to apologize three years ago for these schools, they set up a, a bogus whitewash. They call it the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but it doesn't have any power to uh, issue subpoenas or conduct criminal investigations. It, uh, and it, it allows the churches really to, to completely uh, get off the hook and, and not be answerable for any of these things. So. You know, it's the, the government, as could be expected in any regime that commits genocide, they've done their best to, to camouflage the whole thing and make it seem like, yeah, some kids were harmed, but there really wasn't mass murder going on. Well, you know, their own documents show otherwise, and now we have the bones to prove otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so just tell us what reconciliation means as well. It's, it's an interesting, uh, it's not exactly what people might think it means, is it? Well, no, there's the kind of common usage of the word uh, where we're, we're told that it means to sit down and work out the difference with somebody else and come to a meeting of minds. But it's an old Roman term. It meant uh, a, a, concili a reconciliation is when uh, a tribal chieftain who would rebel against Rome would be brought back and forced to kneel in front of the emperor and offer homage again. That was called a reconciliation, being reconciled to, to the emperor. And then he was, yeah. was killed. Um, after being reconciled, and the, the, the Vatican used the same term, term during the Inquisition, where they would reconcile people who had lapsed into heresy by seizing all their property. That was called a reconciliation. So really what it means is that uh, somebody resubordinates themselves, and in the case of Canada, that's been the case. Indians, in order to get a bit of money in compensation for all of this years of terror in these so-called schools, they had to sign off any legal action against the government of the churches. So they basically subordinated themselves and allowed these criminals to get away with this and return for a little bit of money. So, I mean, yeah, that, that's a term. We have to look behind the meaning of, of these words. Mm. Mm. And, yes, that's interesting that the uh, the language is often twisted. Um, this is something that uh, a lot of the free man stuff is beginning to reveal, isn't it, how words can mean one thing in uh, under one set of rules and then another thing in just common language that we might use. Right. Yeah. Uh, I understand that you've uh, 
been uh, the, some some of the free men in Canada have been working with the uh, or helping some of the native people understand their rights. Is that right? Very much, Deb. You know, um, it's interesting when the Mohawks announced in early October they they invited me. There, there was a, a group of nine elders in the Mohawk Nation who asked me to come last April and start doing surveys and and digs around the old school because they'd heard about my work. And um, the Mohawks traditionally were allied with the British against the Americans. So this land was given to them after the American Revolution for the Mohawks to settle in. And so they had kind of this um, this long tradition of saying, well, we're allies with the Crown. We're not, uh, we weren't conquered. So they have a real sense of their own sovereignty. They say this is still their land. The area around uh, central to southern Ontario there's about a million acres traditionally that was Mohawk territory, and they still consider them sovereign people. They don't recognize the government or Canada or the Crown of England. And so as a result, a number of the people who come to help us are from the free men on the land movement. And as a matter of fact, they, um, the people who are helping us with the dig from Toronto who were very much saw this as an opportunity to say, well, it's also a chance for people to declare their sovereignty from the Crown and say, under common law, we don't have the obligation to go along with the Crown and these churches when they committed these crimes. So there's kind of a nice uh, uh, convergence happening between Native sovereignty and, and the free men on the land. That's great. Are you aware of Dean Clifford? No. Oh, right. Oh, well, he's, I know he's been active. Uh, he's been uh, uh, in uh, jail a few times, and uh, he spent his time there well talking to Indians. <laughs> Oh yeah. So you may find yourself mm. in contact with him at some point. Yeah, Google him. He's quite a Canadian, like yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So well, uh, go ahead. I was just going to. I was just going to uh, say that um, I think that in uh, Canada, a lot of people, like the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they actually have uh, some Indian chiefs who kind of stand up there with the politicians. And say, oh, you know, we're um, we're we're really glad that you're, um, uh, you know, saying sorry about all this. And they kind of they're they're kind of the the, the white man's bitches in a way. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, the, these chiefs, I heard you saying one time, these chiefs are actually accountable to the crown. They're they're not accountable. They're not like the elders, the native elders, are they? No, they're not. They're legal agents of the Crown. They're like members of Parliament or judges or lawyers here. They all take an oath of allegiance to the Crown, not to the people. And, uh, it, you know, on any Indian reservation, there's the chief and council who are government appointed and paid. And then there's the traditional elders, the clan mothers and, and the traditional chiefs. And they're really two separate societies. And the, the traditional ones are the people working with me. The band council chiefs tend to be very hostile to the work I do. Uh, because they've been told to do so. To give you an example, right in, in Ganata, where, which is the, the territory around the Brantford Residential School, um, the, the chief uh, of, the, of the tribal council there, Bill Montour, the day we started digging uh, and surveying the grounds of the school with the ground penetrating radar, he was called to Ottawa, and he came back after the government read him the Riot Act, and he basically said to everybody, you're not supposed to cooperate with this investigation. The government's told us not to. And, you know, it's really that blatant. Um, mm. These chiefs have a standard of living a lot better than most of the, the Native people in Canada. Uh, they, they were trained in the residential school to identify with, with the white society, and, you know, they're, they're kind of a brainwashed, collaborating group. You know, so you can't really expect a lot from them, but they don't have a lot of credibility on the ground with their own people. So we find a lot of people coming out and supporting us are just ordinary Mohawk Indians, young people who, who want to see these children brought home, given a proper burial. And also, we're gathering forensic evidence from what we're finding to put together an indictment of the Crown uh, and these churches that we're going to bring over to Europe in, in April. And hopefully, I'll be able to get back to England after being banned in the end of May. <laughs> and, and, and. Yeah. But, uh, we will turn up the guns this time, make sure you get in. Don't say that. Well, proverbial guns, that is. I'll come in by rubber boat at night. Yeah, on. man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Parachutes. Hang glide. Well, you can come right into Brighton, you know, and just well, get that's on that. an idea. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, Kevin, we've got a, we've got a lot of people on, and I'm, I'm, I just wanted to tell them that I've unmuted all the mics, so if they have got any questions, does anyone have anything that they would like to, to say or add to Kevin? Uh -oh. 
Which one's that? Caroline. Okay. I'm dropping another quarter. I don't care what anybody else does. <laughs> <laughs> I got to play another game. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Swami, have you got any questions for Kevin? You know, <clears throat> it it's just so sad. I don't mm. even know what to ask. Mm. These people have turned their backs on their fellows. Some of them have, not all of them. Well, no, no, not all, but the ones who caused the damage to occur, you know, we have to lay this at their feet. Yeah. Have they not done that? Have they worked for the people they represent, the ones they are born of? This couldn't yeah. take place. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, in the in the residential schools, the um, the children there were um, punished heavily if they were caught speaking their own language or um, in any way kind of carrying on any kind of their own traditions. Um, but children who informed on other children um, were were given slight privileges, and it was these children who became the kind of informant children that were then called um, the. the hold privilege and who are beholden and accountable to the crown um, so yeah they they kind of choose the uh, choose the ones they're going to to train carefully well, Kevin yeah, yeah. Ke Kevin tell us a little bit about um, some of the, um, the the way that the the churches have been used uh, as kind of uh, experimental grounds for things like Tammy flu and things like this. Yeah, well, I first encountered that when I was a minister on the West Coast. Uh, I, I found often when I went out to the Indian reservations that the government uh, public health nurses would be showing up and literally shoving needles into the arms of Native kids. And I'd say to the mothers and fathers, like, why are you allowing them to do that? And they'd say to me, we can't, we have to. Um, they said that we don't have any choice. And, and when I looked into that, sure enough, in the Indian Act, it says in Section 76 that no Indian on reservation can refuse medical treatment or, or they even uh, have to agree to involuntary hospitalization. So um, that's the reality that, that Indians are like still in concentration camps and they don't have legal rights. They're not citizens under the law. That was used during uh, the last couple of years during the swine flu hoax. Um, they went out to the local Indian reservation who were trying Tamiflu drugs and other things on the native population. It was the one area of the Canada that was declared a pandemic zone was the Ahousad Indian Reservation because half the flu had, people had come down with swine flu after being given these drugs and shots. You so know, so did, I mean, were, yeah. So how did these people out, way out in the way back of nowhere suddenly get this? This flu epidemic. <laughs> well, well, I, I looked into that for about a year before that. These federal health Canada nurses had been coming out and trying out these drugs, and they were using them as guinea pigs. And um, you know, so there was even an item in the Canadian news that the government was shipping body bags to West Coast Indian reservations, and it was kind of like almost, well, yeah, we know we're going to kill off a certain number of Indians, and here's the bags to bag them off up in. You know, it, it was just they were disgusting. You know? They were sending the bags up there prior to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And that was the news and nobody commented on it. It's kind of like, oh yeah, more dead Indians, right? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I saw an interesting comment that you made uh, as well about the... I know that you've been down at the Occupy down in uh, Vancouver. Yeah. And um, I saw you posted an interesting comment one day about um, uh, the... Uh, some, I think the mayor there had said something about the maybe fake protesters, and you made a comment about the fake police. <laughs> well, yeah. But, you know, Vancouver is, is one of the big drug capitals in North America, and the police are very heavily involved in the drug trade here. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons I lost my program that I had for 10 years on, on Vancouver Co-op Radio was because I had a native woman on the air um, and she described seeing Vancouver police taking Aboriginal women out to the farm of a serial killer who was making snuff films 
And they basically, because they were, he was called uh, Willie Pickton. He was actually uh, on trial now. I know, I know, I've heard that story, yeah. And, and actually, what it didn't make the news is that the police were involved with him in delivering Aboriginal women out to the site. And so when we exposed this publicly, you know, I was thrown right off the air um, of this government funded radio program, but uh, a radio station. But, you know, it shows you that. Um, you can go so far in this stuff, and then they do things like shut you off the air and, and ban you from getting into England and that kind of thing. But yeah. it's all because, you know, we're pointing at the same crime in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, also, like, the, the way that you were so unceremoniously flung from the church, yet um, mm -hmm. clergymen who were raping, known rapists within the church, when nothing was happening, I think there was, was it Russell, Russell Crosswood? Crossley, yeah, he was, yeah, uh, Crossley. it was kind of ironic. I, I, you, if you, my book, Unrepentant, Disrobing the Emperor, um, was actually published in England last year. Mm -hmm. And you can read it in there, I give kind of a detailed account of this Russell Crossley fellow who, at the very same time I was being thrown out of the church, he was uh, serving time in prison for raping women in the church, but he never... Uh, was disowned by the church. After he got out of prison, they kept him on salary and pension the whole time, and he retired uh, without ever being defrocked. So, I mean, it kind of tells you uh, the scheme of these mm. churches. I mean, they, have, uh, they don't make any bones. It's kind of like when the Pope signs letters ordering the cover-up of the, of the rape of children. He can get away with that. And um, I know there's some lawyers who are trying to bring him to the International Criminal Court these days, but, you know, it's really what we're up against. We see that all over the world, in Ireland, England, everywhere. Yeah. These yeah. churches are a law, really. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know you that you've uh, been in contact with other groups, haven't you, around the world, like in Ireland, and even in Thailand. I seem to remember you uh, talking about how in Thailand now they're setting up. Um, is it? Uh, I don't know if it's church funded or they're setting up some kind of schools for the um, native people, yeah. of, uh, children in Thailand. You know, like oh, you know, good work church setting up school for children but they're being run in exactly the same way that the um, church run schools were run in Canada the internment schools they are it was, um, the, uh, a man Matthew McDaniel works with us in Thailand he's uh, he was actually deported from Thailand but he worked with the Aka people in the northern highlands and he found that the Baptist Church in America and the Rotary Clubs were going in setting up these these um, so-called schools they turned out to be sweatshops uh, where they were bringing in kids as young as four and five, and they were plugged into the uh, uh, the, the sex trade in Bangkok, the child sex trade as well, mm -hmm. providing these kids. Um, and, you know, I mean, you see this all over the world. That's We have groups in, in uh, our international tribunal in the crimes of church and state actually have groups operating like um, the folks in Ireland, Jerry O'Donovan in Cork, yeah. and some people in Dublin. They've been very active um, identifying these priests who have been sheltered by the by the by the police and the government. Um, and, and so, you know, it, one of the things I was doing the number of times I was coming to England was trying to set up a network where we could bring all of these, this evidence to, to not only to the public eye, but also to link it up with things happening today, like the Holly Greek campaign and, um, you know, things like that, to show people that these are ongoing crimes and our children are at risk every day because of these criminal bodies, right? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. 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 I don't know if um, any of our other listeners know about the um, Holly Grieg uh, case that's going on over here. Uh, just very briefly, it's um, a case of a, um, a Down syndrome girl who um, was abused by a paedophile ring within this country that involved her father and her being shared within this paedophile ring. Um, and um, there, were, there were some... Very high Some profile, quite high profile, high profile names, uh, people involved in this. I don't thing. want to mention anybody. Gordon Brown, if you're listening, I hope you're sleeping well tonight. He's our former prime minister. <laughs> well, we, we don't really know who was involved in that. I don't think actually Gordon Brown's name has been involved with, uh, linked with that. But there were certainly some high profile members of her community that were linked with it. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, the, it's it. it the, the, the fact that her case has been so um, swiftly uh, swept under the carpet and is not being allowed to see the light of day within court, she can find no justice through courts um, because they just don't want this to be brought out, talked about. They just don't want anything to do with it. 
and it's all being tied up in paperwork. Um, so yeah, there are certainly some very sinister things going on. Okay, Kevin, we're going to take uh, a little break here, and um, we'll still be able to talk to you in the break, um, but will, will we be able to talk to him in the break, actually? If... Well, no, because of things. No, okay. Right, we won't be able to talk to you in the break, Kevin, but we're just going to take um, two minutes or so for yeah. a little um, restroom break. Okay, and we are back now after that song. Thankfully, nothing tragic happened during that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kevin, so uh, we were just talking there in the break a little bit about how um, another thing that you were discovering as you, you were getting deeper and deeper in, into this whole story of the, how the native people had been destroyed was the fact that the um, church and the state were also very, very heavily involved in... Um, business with the logging and mineral companies and there seemed to be something of a kind of three-way thing going on there they were all scratching one another's back in that the the church was uh, kicking people off the land and then the the mineral and uh, logging companies would come on and then they would give heavy donations to the churches um would you like to sort of talk a little bit about that well that's really how i lost my job back in uh, early 1995 uh, the, you see what happened was the, the crown of england declared itself owner of all the land in what's now Canada. And they set up thing called clergy reserves, where if a missionary of the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church was in an area, they'd get all this free land. If they pitched their tent and started preaching to the Indians, they'd get two, three hundred, three thousand acres of land, whatever. Later, the churches would sell off that land for a lot of money to logging, mining companies, all sorts of powerful interests. And none of the money would ever go back to the Indians. Well, I found out about one case about that and um, involving uh, a big contributor to the United Church, um, a logging company called Mill McMillan Bloedel. And, um, you know, I wrote to the church, and that's what got me fired when I pointed out their little backroom deal in stolen native land. But the thing to realize, is I can give you just a brief little story of how this happened. There was a Church of England missionary called John Sheepshanks. He came out to uh, what's now British Columbia. He was partners with members of the church and the colonial government of BC back then uh, in something called the Puget, land, Puget Sound Land Company, which was owned by the Hudson's Bay Company. They went into an area, and they, what they did is they, they bought up all the land of the Chilcotin Indians. This is in north central British Columbia. And there were like eight to 10,000 of these Chilcotin Indians alive, but they preempted their land. They went into the legislature, and they bought up all their land. Just before, or um, after having done that, Sheepshanks, this John Sheepshanks, went into the area and inoculated all of the Chilcotins with smallpox vaccine. And most of them died off. There was a death of rate of about 90% of the Chilcotins in about a six-month period due to a massive outbreak of smallpox. And then guess who gets all the land? He did this all over British Columbia. So the church missionary worked with the, the land, the, the government, members of the, these are top members of the, of the colonial administration, the attorney general, the premier, and the members of this land company. They're all profiting. And later, John Sheepshanks gets appointed to the House of Lords and becomes the Bishop of Norwich in England mm -hmm. when he dies in 1908. So this guy got the big payoff by the crown for having wiped out the Chilcotin Indians and helping line the pocket of the colonial administration and also the, you know, the, the, land, the, uh, the fur company and the, you know, the Hudson's Bay Company and all these land brokers. So it shows you that one example of that's part of the history of Canada. Church, state, and, and the, the private companies working together just to wipe out Indians, grab the land, the same thing's going on today. Mm -hmm. And that just completely highlights the appalling honor system as well, where people who have really just aided this disgusting machine in some way uh, get, get, these, um, get these honors flung on them. And uh, we're meant to think that they're high-standing members of, of, uh, mm -hmm. of, our, of, well, society, but whose society? Their society, isn't it? Because it certainly isn't a civil society that we would like to see. And, and uh, yeah, so this guy was, was given, like, the, the high honors and celebrated. And for what? For killing thousands of people? Yeah, literally. I mean, it's the same way, you know, in the in the slave trade. When I was in Liverpool, they've got a really good museum there, uh, the Slavery Museum, where they, they openly talk about, and, you know, in a way I wish Canadian museums had that kind of honesty, because they don't. But at least in the Liverpool Museum, they were honestly describing how the churches 
the all the political leaders in that they were all deeply involved in the slave trade in Liverpool, like Bristol uh, and London. They were all built on on that misery and suffering and death of millions of people. Mm. Um, you know, I think that that's just fabric of so-called Western civilization, and uh, that's what we're facing today. You know, it's not like it's ever really changed. You know, yeah, it's so. funny you say that you like the uh, kind of honesty that they they put in their museums, but it. Even though there's honesty there, it doesn't really make much difference because I think it, it, they know that they can get away with being that honest in this country because we'll all just moan about it. We won't actually do anything. Mm. Whereas perhaps yeah. in Canada, they, they wouldn't be that honest because it would offend people um, because yeah. they like to think that they have a high opinion of, of themselves so, uh, mor morally in some way. But so it, it, it doesn't matter either way whether they admit it or not, at least not in this country, because, like I say, in this country, it just gives us something to moan about, but we don't actually do anything about it. Well, at least people have to know that the people in power are criminals and murderers, and they always yeah. have been. Yeah, uh, I remember absolutely. That somebody once told me, you know, who the biggest drug, drug dealer in history was, was Queen Victoria, because at the height of the, her empire in the 1840s, about a quarter of all revenue in the British Empire came from the opium trade in China. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the opium wars that went on to force the Chinese to stay addicted to this drug. I mean... Yeah, Hong Kong. Well, that's what... <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, I, I should just mention that uh, if people want to read up on this, uh, I just want to give some of our websites. Um, our, my research is all posted online. Uh, the book is called Hidden No Longer, Genocide in Canada, Past and Present. And it's at www.hiddennolonger.com. That's where you can read about the Sheepshanks case and, and all this other evidence of massive killings in the, in the residential schools. HiddenNoLonger.com. Our main website is HiddenFromHistory.org. That's where you can see our film Unrepentant. And also our International Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State is ITCCS.org. I, um, I put some links up um, to that on the Friends of Freeman site. Okay. Um, which which is a site that a lot of people who are listening uh, yeah. to this show will be linked to. Um, so if they go to the event, today's event, they'll, they'll be able to get hold of those links there. Um, and, yeah, just as well, talking about how uh, the land was taken and the mineral rights and the loggers were, were all involved, um, it, now there's uh, something called fracking going on, whereby the gas companies are coming in and just taking the land or not so much stealing the land these days in a lot of places they're paying good price to farmers who are just allowing them to take the land and uh, they're, they're doing these fracking campaigns one of the um, one of the uh, callers who comes on here regularly uh, was telling us that in Canada they've set up these like cities for workers um, and they're going to start these huge fracking campaigns in Canada, which have already been going on. And uh, I mean, this this is just—it's not. I mean, it's bad enough. The oil industry was bad enough, but fracking is just a step further. Mm -hmm. It's just complete degradation of the land and pollution of the water supply beyond repair. Yeah, there's a there's a case now in the Canadian media. They're making a big uh, show of how there's an Indian reservation at the Wetaskan in northern Ontario where there's no running water and the kids are living in shacks. And they always focus on these stories as if it's a rare event. Well, most Native people in, on reservation live in those conditions, and it's because the environment is getting so degraded and, the, and their lake systems and watersheds are being destroyed through rampant mining and, and also the uranium industry. Um, this has been going on for many decades. A lot of the depleted uranium in the U.S. military, well, the military around the world, comes from North Yeah, Central. this is a big yeah. problem now as well, depleted uranium in other countries Canada, as well. Canada has the biggest um, deposits of that, I believe. Is that true? Along mm. with Australia? Right. In uh, Northwest Territories in Saskatchewan, it's, uranium is, um, you know, the mining industry there has caused enormous degradation. Like, uh, in areas of South Dakota and northern Saskatchewan, the cancer rate is about 5,000 times the national average. Oh. I mean, literally every Native family is dying of cancer um, because of the, the uranium tailings and the in-situ mining that goes on that leaks into the watershed. Oh. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a what better proof you have that genocide is continuing. This is aimed at Native people. A friend of ours who was around the other day was just talking about, um, remember, it was round. Mm-hmm. He was talking about, where was he? He was in... Oh, uh, um, 
Oh, um, so I told me I'm near Greece. <laughs> <laughs> not Crete. Yeah. No, no, not Crete. Uh, Cyprus. 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 Yeah, Cyprus. Yeah, they basically um, had a, a pile of uh, uranium t weapons that were, uh, or ammunition that was going to be um, decommissioned, and they left it in the sun and forgot about it, and basically it heated up and exploded right on the beach, so it went straight into the, uh, into the, water. Into the water, and also uh, they don't have any fresh water there, so they have a desalination plant, and... That was right next to where the desalination plant was as well, sort of thing. So the whole water supply, including the ocean, has now um, got to uranium all over it. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's just, it, this is a really big problem now, isn't it, mm. as well? It's going on around the world. I mean, they're using these weapons. It, it's completely um, ruining the areas where they're dropping them. But not only that, it's blowing across on winds and things. Yeah. and. Yeah. Over here on the west coast here, um, after the Fukushima disaster in Japan, mm -hmm. yeah. the, the Canadian government will not release test results of west coast water. Um, but independent, uh, I, I, there's a chemist and other people who have been posting this stuff online. Yeah, we've, we've, we've seen this. The strontium and the, the uh, cesium and the, the other radioactive substances, it's something like 250 times higher now than it was before Fukushima, all through the British Columbia water. So that's what it's drinking as I'm talking to you. You know, it's like we're getting irradiated. <laughs> it's like we're all in a nuclear war. Yeah. 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 yeah it's yeah, like a yeah. silent nuclear yeah. war that's going on, isn't it? It's yeah, going on very quietly, really and does, yeah. yeah, people really need to start getting a little bit kind of smart about what's going on in the world around them because. Uh, well, yeah. wake up and die off. Yeah. Go it's crazy. Yeah. yeah it's crazy yeah. stuff. And when they do begin to realise, they're going to just freak out mm. and just. Thing. And and it's like you say, the people who are in charge are complete nut jobs who don't care how yeah. many people they kill. They get rewarded for killing lots of people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just. Uh, I remember seeing an interview with uh, I guess with Michael Moore or somebody when the New York occupation started on Wall Street, and he went up to a policeman who was there to tell people to kind of be careful and not break your windows or whatever. And the cops said, yeah, well, I support you guys because they screwed us out of our pension too, right? The yeah. banks. And, and, you know, I often find that when we have protests, the police are often on our side. I just say to them, look, why serve this murderous, you know, uh, government and, yeah. and its churches when they're, they have a false jurisdiction here in the first place? They just came and grabbed the land and told everybody that we had to basically be their servants. And... You know, that, that's something I found all over the world where I go. People are waking up to that, and mm -hmm. that's why I really love the Freeman on the Land movement because we're just taking back our what the Mohawks called reclamation. We're reclaiming what's ours by natural birth. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's it. We're not reclaiming your sovereignty. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's it. Um, there was quite um, uh, an interesting story. I don't know if this has actually been confirmed or not, but I've, I've seen a story that's been online in a couple of places um, about a National Guard unit who refused to do the questionnaire which had questions in it saying uh, would you fire on your own citizens and uh, apparently they refused to fill in this questionnaire. Now I, don't, that, that, that I think when, the last thing I read was that that was an unconfirmed report yeah. but, um, but that would be very heartwarming if that were true yeah. because this is, this is what it's going to take. It's going to take <coughs> the people who were trying to actually instill, uh, uh, inflict these, uh, just the, just ordinary everyday people who are being used as, uh, uh, well, they're, not, they're nothing more than cannon fodder themselves, yeah. but that are being used to kind of enforce these ridiculous laws that are protecting not their families and not protecting them either and not protecting the good um, people of this earth, they're only protecting the bad people of this earth. So, um, there's a big movement actually in the States, and it started in Canada too, yeah. uh, to reach the, uh, the, the active service soldiers and get them to take a pledge to defend the Constitution and to, to refuse orders that would allow them to, you know, arrest people um, without charge and, uh, you know, basically to, to ha say that we, they shouldn't be used to impose a police state. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that that's really promising. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is this one of Caroline? Are you there? 
Yeah, can you hear me, guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Dave, you, you want to talk to Kevin? Yeah, I went ahead and called in. I uh, There was some problems trying to get the conference call. Kevin, I tried yeah. to tell you a little earlier. Yeah, frankly, I want to tell you I really respect you and admire you, and you got a lot of courage. Uh, I, I, You guys have been very fascinating. I know a lot of people have been listening both on Facebook and Friends of Freeman, and uh, you guys are the topics you've been discussing between the uranium and the radiation, which is true, but then also back to the church thing, I, I can really relate to what you went through, Kevin, except yours is drastically more involved. Uh, the folks here all know I actually uh, I'm leaving St. Louis, uh, Missouri, in the States because I actually got involved with the uh, pedophilia thing, and it turned out it got into the country and also kids that are missing. And it, it got so violent, you know, I got attacked in my house, literally leaving my house. So what you're running into, which, you know, yours is very orchestrated, targets directly at the Native Canadians and Mohawk. But I know I'm in the United States. Uh, when I went back, I went back at least 100 years in St. Louis, and, you know, kids are being swapped held. And, uh, those, you know, from Milwaukee to Boston, kids were being swapped all over the place. And they, you know, it is really creepy. I know even, uh, what was it, the Queen was expecting those 10 kids, only five of them showed up. I can hear somebody move furniture in the background. If you guys, whoever's moving furniture might want to be a little more, you mute your mic. Um, and, and it is funny that you mentioned the radiation, because I, I, where you're at, I'd actually considered moving to Vancouver until I've, I've talked to so many people, including Mitchell, about the Fukushima radiation. Yeah. If they have well, you know, oh. yeah, it's all over the world, Caroline. You know this 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 disease. You know this attack on children and the land and and all of us. So, um, I I was going to say that you know one of the things that's going on in the states now is I'm really impressed by, like you know during the occupation movement in San Francisco, they had about a hundred thousand people that shut down the waterfront, and they were getting a lot of working steps to help them. Right? I mean, it wasn't just the way the media portrayed these long-haired young kids. This was a lot of mainstream America involved. And like all over the world, it's like that, too. So I think, you know, people are really waking up. They know time's short. Well, I think you're so right. Uh, I know there's over 2,000 occupies now between the United States and, and Canada, and I've done a couple shows on them. And there's Occupy Brazil, there's Occupy Nova Scotia, there's Occupy Greece, there's Occupy China, believe it or not, and there's Occupy Korea. The, the, the concept is clear to people. I mean, we have to be careful to watch out for provocateurs that get inside and, you know, everybody's got their own agendas. But the grassroots yeah. Occupy movements, I think, really connect with people's heart and souls because everybody knows that really the 99% are the same. We all care yeah. about our families, our home, our gardens. We want to – it's just like on Facebook if you do the right way besides the data mining, but if you do it the right way, people really do find out that from Hong Kong to Nigeria to Iceland to – uh, you know, uh, Edmonton, everybody is the same. We want to have our own little victory gardens, survival gardens, and our families, our pets, our dogs, and whatever faith we choose and whatever uh, sexual prefer preferences people choose, everybody just wants to be free, left alone, and mm -hmm. most people are willing to do their duty and contribute, too. It's just if we can just get the 1% to, you know, take the yokes off and everybody and a few people get up off their knees, we'll have a better shot. Are you still living in the states? Yeah, um, I'm in exile in a hotel at the moment. I've been in I've been oh, okay. from hotels for the last two years. I'm in Columbia, Missouri, right now. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm actually, yeah, they won't let me buy, sell, or stay in my house in St. Louis. Uh, they, they, you don't need to hear all my story, uh, mm -hmm. but I mean, I, yeah, I got everything from attacked in the house for 18 hours and death threats and animals killed and everything. So I learned the hard way. Um, the connection between, and it's not just the Vatican, it's, it's all the box churches, these guys, because, like, Kevin, the one unique thing I found that was, surprised me was how organized selecting the kids were. Like, in the States, all the little kids go to parochial schools. There's little school books where everybody takes their picture every year. And what they were doing was like a menu for these guys. And it, it didn't matter if you were Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, whatever. These guys who donate to the church and donate to the big politicians – they basically yeah. put the kids out, and the kids would be invited to be altar boys. And then, you know, the family says, yeah, go for it. Make connections. You'll get to college, all that crap. Because they, they tend to target the poor, the vulnerable, the ones who are desperate. 
and these kids, you know, obviously the retreat for a week or a month or a day, whatever, these kids would be used. It, it destroyed so many lives. And St. Louis is notorious for child sex slavery. My mom was actually put in an orphanage, even though she had a family, but she was a poor white kid. Um, and it, this has been very uh, – in St. Louis, I was able to track it back. They've even had these phony uh, orphanages going up to, uh, back 100 years. And, uh, you know, what's scary is like what I found out in St. Louis is the media will not cover it because they tend to get jobs after they retire with, like, the church or the Vatican or something in the archdiocese in St. Louis. But then also the police generally – now, some of the police are excellent. And they actually helped protect me a few times. But uh, it, it's just scary because there's, like, goon squads or, like, their own version of Gestapo, and they will go after people who are activists and, tar you know, they'll target the heck out of you. So, yeah, right uh -huh. now I'm still trying to sell the house in St. Louis, and uh, I I'm living on uh, uh, in a uh, hotel at the moment, but it it's actually been nice. I even had a hawk fly by la this morning, and uh, I'm living here with my kitty cat. So uh, it's, been an, it's been a learning experience, which I would recommend to anybody. Well, I was just going to say if you drop drop me an email because um, I, I I just like to connect people all the time who are facing the the monster, right? And uh, I, I, my email is uh, uh, hidden from history one, like the number one, hidden from history one at gmail dot com. Okay. Well, you know, I got that because on my Facebook page, and I I sent you you'll, you'll see them when you get back to your Facebook. I wasn't sure which one yeah. you're using. I sent you some invites, but uh, I, on my page, I've got a whole bunch of your stuff up there, and if anybody's once you go to my page, everybody, most of the people who listen, Carolyn Rose Goida, G O E A, go there on Facebook and open everybody. There's a whole bunch of stuff from Kevin. There's that the um, the the page. I know you've got the, the PDF. The hidden no longer is there. Um, the the also the information. These other interviews you did are there, and you're just extraordinary. I just really admire you. Well, it's good to know you. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll put up a photo album of some of the pictures along with all the links, and Pycheck has done such a marvelous job of putting them up on Friends of Freeman, so I'll make sure That's that me, anybody, Kevin. Yeah, and, yeah, and I'll make sure that uh, all the people who are listening go to the Facebook page, and there will be a photo album. You know what uh, I always found very, uh, just thought, well, you know, for, for the kind of work that Kevin does, uh, it, it's such a dark subject. But um, it could only be someone like Kevin that could do this because, um, Kevin, you have such um, – you, you, you're not flippant in any way, but you have such a light way of dealing with everything. And even when you were banned from coming in the country, it was like, oh, no, Kevin's been banned from coming into England. And then the next thing we know, you're involved in digs and you're finding the bones and it's all like, yay, go, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you got any jokes, Kevin? I know. <laughs> I remember you saying that you used to start your sermons with uh, with a joke, but often uh, the parishioners didn't get it. <laughs> they fall flat on their face, and people think that you can't tell jokes. You got to be serious in this church, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, really we're talking got about water to wine and stuff. Yeah, they really yeah. got. They should be happy, right? You shouldn't be uh, depressed, right? They missed the whole point. Well, that's what keeps you going, um, our humor and our love and just our human side, right? This is a battle for our humanity, so you've got to hold on to that or you're sunk, right? Well, you said it, humor and human, you know, these are two two things that resonate together, and we mm. really do have to try to keep the the humor in human. Why yeah. don't you tell them what you put as your vocation on your Facebook page? Uh, I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't be bashful. I bet it was good. Uh. <laughs> go, on, well, see, go on, Carolyn, tell us. Oh, now I've got to go back to the page because you. Oh God, how do you spell your? How do you, how do you pronounce and and say your Mohawk name? How do you spell it? I'll pull it up real quick. E but Eagle. I, was it Eagle Strong Boy? No, no, no. Ron, oh, it's Ronald Sani, which is a Mohawk. It means a powerful voice that warns the people. Give me the first couple letters. I'll pull it back up because I oh. just sent you. I just. I just lost you. <laughs> oh, R A W. R A W. Okay. Yeah, because you've got a couple pages up there, so I had a couple places I was posting your stuff. But you put that yeah. you were a uh, anarchist and troublemaker by nature, and you know it was really cute how you wrote that. But <laughs> well, I, yeah. I thought that was neat. But you know, you got to do that. You know, and I, yeah. you know, you'd be the kind of person if you might enjoy this thought that. St. Louis, you know, to pay off all the child pedophilia cases, they actually started shutting down other 
um, churches like the, they shut the Ukrainian church years ago and then they started tar targeting the Polish church because it had a huge endowment, you know, and they had to start paying off these lawyers because the kids didn't get much. But um, it was uh, amazing. When I had uh, taken a trip to the Soviet Union, when it was still the Soviet Union, I had attended a Georgian Orthodox church by request and I'd also gone with some refuseniks to a synagogue. And it was amazing to see there all these people being photographed, you know, because, you know, if you weren't, uh, if you wanted to be in the Communist Party, you couldn't attend any church, obviously. So I saw that there. And then here just a couple years ago in St. Louis, uh, I, I decided to go to the Polish church. It was a Christmas Eve mass, and I'd been invited. And uh, they had shut down the church because they wouldn't turn over their endowment to the archdiocese to pay off the pedophile cases. And uh, so a, a, an elder Polish priest uh, volunteered to do the mass. And of course, he was excommunicated. You know what that's all about. And uh, he was excommunicated for doing the mass. But the, the strangest thing to me was it was probably the most moving uh, midnight mass I'd ever been to. And frankly, probably one of the most moving masses I've ever been to because people were there daring to be there because they were all threatened with excommunications for attending the mass. And it was amazing to see people taking pictures of all the people in St. Louis leaving the church. And just like they had done in the Soviet Union. It was just, it was unbelievable. I don't know where that music came in from. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I know it's, you know, I know you went through a hard, rough time being excommunicated and everything. So I thought, yeah, that people, even in this modern age, have to risk whatever they want. Because like I said, I and saw how people. Is US wow, what is that? For you? Right now, every phone call we have. Are you here? watching TV, Caroline, at the same oh. time? I haven't had the TV on in the hotel room for a month. See <laughs> <laughs> if it's coming for me, I'll turn off the mic. Not not sure where that was coming from. <laughs> I've muted the others anyway, so hopefully we won't get um, any more interference there. Sorry, Caroline. Do you want to, Caroline? Do you want to carry on? I just muted the mic. Oh, I've muted your mic. Sorry. Uh, oh, I'm pressing the wrong thing. I'm trying desperately to think of some jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, your mic goes blank when you need to. Yeah, sorry, that's um not quite sure where that interference is coming from, but it stopped now anyway. But um We do have a difficult time when I join a conversation, don't we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's funny that. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Uh, yeah, you were you were excommunicated, Kevin. But uh, um, even people that were trying to support you at the time, uh, not that there were many of them, but uh, people who did support you, they lost their jobs too, didn't they? Well, that happened. Well, you know, especially if you're native, you're really targeted if you get involved publicly in this work. But. Um, even people who are, I'm, one example, there's this woman, Dr. Jennifer Wade, and she set up Amnesty International in Canada. She was one of the co-founders back in the early 60s. And the United Church went after her because she got the media to come and, and attend my defrocking trial. And, she, you know, she exposed the fact that they were spending a quarter of a million bucks to toss me out of the church and all this corrupt nonsense. And, and uh, they went after her, and they went around and systematically undermined any group that, that had invited her to come and speak. They went and spoke to her employer. They pulled out all stops to make sure that anybody who came out and supported me, you know, faced that kind of harassment. So that kind of stuff still goes on regularly, you know. Gee, so it's very, it's very, that's why it's so difficult to get you any media cover coverage, but very easy for... Um, for the authorities yeah. just to to put like you say any any of the uh indian chiefs that are w within their own jurisdiction they can put people like that up and say oh yes the government's doing great work um but you're not actually there or being covered to say well hold on a minute this is all a scam you're being sold yeah. something here well the media is so absolutely controlling canada and you know perfect example of that we sent out a press release when we found these bones 
I mean, this is historic news. For the first yeah. time, graves are open. They find the bones of children. Yeah. Not one media in Canada yeah. picked that up. The local radio station and newspaper center reported. That's it. Can you imagine? I mean, <laughs> I'm covering bones of children at, at, at you know, these yeah. so-called residential schools. When it's been in the news and everything, nobody reports it. I mean, it's just incredible, the amount of control that they have over it. My God. Oh, yeah. remember, remember uh, even uh, Colby, when he was the CIA director, was called before Congress. He admitted that the CIA controlled all the media, and that was back, I don't know, I guess that would probably be in the Nixon era. Of course, you know, he was promptly fired and replaced by uh, George Pappy Bush, you know, mm -hmm. who's, into children, who's into children himself. And remember Ben Franklin, when they started to make the museum in London, you know, he, he basically hit out the whole revolution in England. Uh, they found little kids' bones. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've just been reading about Ben Franklin and the Hellfire Club. Not, yeah. not very nice. Eh? Yeah, they tried to say that all they were playing with cadavers as medical experiments, but uh, they were all children's bones. And you know, in St. Louis, they had this situation where the kids are still alive. We found kids, a couple kids that were held for 10, 14 years, and it only one story made the national news. And that one kid actually had to run away because another little kid had just been taken. And the police and everybody knew, and they just were ignoring the stories. But like you said, it, it, when you said you, you gave the information to the media, the scary thing is when you do, then they target the people that are, you know, trying to get the information out. So that's why places like Facebook yeah. and YouTube, if, if people can get on YouTube or places like this, Blog Talk, Friends of Freeman, get the information out, you know, the more sunshine it gets, you know, the cockroaches go running, you know. And it's like that's yeah. the only thing that really protects people is to seem like to get – you know, some sunlight on it and to expose it, you know, and, and, and to try to wake the sheeple up from, you know, a lot of people are just yeah. in denial. They don't want to believe it, you know. Well, yeah. I, that's why I, I especially love coming to England because, you know, uh, Canada has a, a, a this long relationship, of course, but half the tourists who come to Canada are British. Um, and it's kind of got a, a weak, uh, um, it's vulnerable when it comes to its public image in England. So I remember when we were on the protest, the Pope March in September 2010, we were, it was great. There was 20,000 of us walking around, uh, start, you know, past Trafalgar Square right down to Whitehall. And um, at one point, we passed by the Canadian uh, Canada House right on Trafalgar Square. And I stopped, and we, and we pulled out our banners saying, all the children need a proper burial. And I started ca talking to people, and soon we had a crowd of two or 300 people from the march all gathered around, and I told them, you know, don't spend your money in Canada and boycott Canada uh, because of the, the genocide of the children. And people were gasping, saying, Canada? Oh, I thought it was a civilized nation, right? Mm -hmm. But I remember one of the women came up to me after. She was from uh, an elder in the uh, uh, St. Martin's in the field, the church right there in Trafalgar Square. And she said, well, I'm going to read your statement uh, at our church next Sunday. And I said, well, good luck. You know, uh, you might have spoken to do that, but... Those are the kind of people who are hoping for it, people right inside who are able to raise this stuff and, and uh, you know. It's very difficult with uh, some people within church because the minute that you start um, talking about anything to do with um, the church being bad, they yeah. immediately get very defensive and think yeah. that you're attacking, uh, that you're attacking, you know, they take it very personally mm -hmm. and they can't see beyond... Um, their own beliefs, their, yeah, their own belief, and they, 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 it's almost like they. There is one little tiny exception to that. The Occupy around around St Paul's Cathedral was actually backed by the church goers, which was very odd, because uh -huh. the church, the, the church itself, was in cahoots with the city, with the corporation of the city. Right. But the, uh, the actual parishioners of the church sort of formed a circle around and did a did a a prayer protest. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to stop to stop the protesters being. And basically, sure. all the uh, uh, I think three senior ministers resigned because of it. Mm. It was quite it was quite a big news for a while, but. Mm. Well, you know, we can drive a wedge between the corporate structure and the church rank and file. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of kind of ordinary Christians support what we're doing, but the corporate structure, you know, the the, the church officials them and their lawyers. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who we're targeting, you know, and we can say, you know, you know, you can be a Christian, you can practice your faith, you don't have to support the corporation, you don't have to give money to the national headquarters to the church, right? Yeah. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. It's very fascist. Yeah. You know, you know, 
Kevin, I just happened to notice. I didn't realize that you'd been a, you'd been beaten up too. I mean, I I got attacked, but I didn't realize you'd. I knew you had spoken out about other people getting hurt, but I didn't realize what was it in 2010 you got beat up. Well, a couple of times. Once after the tribunal as well, back in '98. Um, well, you, the area I work in Vancouver. It's it's a pretty uh, low income area. A lot of drugs and everything, and uh, a lot of the people living on the street are Aboriginal. These are the people I hear these stories from, right? And I was, uh, you know, working down there, there's a certain danger you face, but definitely the times I've been attacked, it wasn't just to be robbed or anything. They didn't rob me. They, it, was, it, was a, it was just uh, intimidation, definitely. Yeah, so, had, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had the same thing. I didn't realize that you'd had that, too. And it, it, it seemed like, you know, they'll try the method of, you know, literally physical intimidation. But I'm, I want to tell you, boy, that takes some guts, too, that you keep going because, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, people say that, they don't realize that's pretty damn scary when you're sitting there faced with people that you realize that are willing to do whatever it takes to get you to quiet down. So, you know, I, well, they're I desperate. You know, oh. they're desperate when they do stuff like that, right? They, it's an admission of failure on their part when they're forced into physical violence. So I just say bring it on. I mean, if you guys are, are that desperate, uh, we have nothing to hide. It's those guys who are who are, totally. who've got a lot to hide. And, and so, you know, their backs are definitely to the wall now that we've, we've excavated these remains. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. You're right because when they strike out at you, it means that you're, you're you're hitting a nail and you're getting them worried. And you're right. That, that's the one thing you people have to remember too. Is it's like when they start getting scared, they're like wounded animals. So that is a good sign that they're actually afraid of you, Kevin. I mean, and let's face it, the church didn't excommunicate you. I mean, gosh, they don't excommunicate the child molesters. You know? No. I mean, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. I've I've heard you saying before, Kevin, as well that uh, that those clergy who uh, kind of uh, turn their head to what's going on and uh, kind of ignore it. They know what's going on, but they kind of ignore it. It's like there's a, a sort of possession going on here, as if they've, they've yeah. lost their souls in some way. That's what I think. I think yeah. it's uh, yeah. a spiritual battle. We're They're just playing greedy. Yeah. Oh. Remember the 70s and the 80s during the, what was it, the period of like what they call it, liberal theology, the church was excommunicating all the, these uh, priests, and I, I knew nuns who, did, who went down to Honduras, never came back. They wound up on the street somewhere on the side, on the Costa Rica or Honduras, and the, the church was actually, you know, applauding and the Pope uh, awarding the, the archbishops and whatnot that were in, in league with the juntas. And here these nuns and priests in liberal theology were trying to help the indigenous in Central America. And they wound up yeah. either getting excommunicated or being found dead on the side of a road. So uh, it, it's yeah. nothing new, you know. But it is amazing I, that, that the Vatican was so tied. I mean, we're not picking on any Pacific church because, I mean, what I found out it was it, they don't, the only faith these people have is in that they're definitely, there is such thing as evil. And they're just greedy and, you know, they, this is a connection. But I, I did not realize that the Vatican was so tied to the orphanages in, in Canada like that. It's like you'd sit there and shake your head going, wait a minute, England's supposed to be Anglican. What the hell are they doing there anyway? Yeah. It's all the churches, well, though, isn't it, Kevin? Too. You talk about that it's not just the um, the uh, Catholic churches. It was the Anglican churches and the United Reformed churches. and. Yeah, they're all in on it, and they're yeah. all in now when they're, they're planning... When they first got it, started getting sued, the churches all sat down and worked together. They had a committee that coordinated their response. Um, you know, they don't pay any of this compensation money going out to survivors. None of it comes from the churches. It's all taxpayers. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like when you're covering up a crime, you don't want to have the, the main perpetrator sitting in the witness stand. You've got to cover these actions. And, and um, now, I mean, another example of that is we found out in these sterilization hospitals, which were all over the country, any native, and it wasn't just natives, any, um, all sorts of people were targeted for sterilization. These were church-backed programs. And, um, you know, they sealed the records of all of the, these hospitals in 1999. Nobody can access them anymore. So, you know, it's, it's this constant uh, concealment. And the only way around that is, you know, continual exposure. And that's what we're trying to do in this tribunal we're doing. Mm. Yeah. I thought that was an excellent analogy that you made, um, Carolyn, by saying that when you shine the light, the uh, the cockroaches scuttle into the dark. <laughs> because that's just what they're like, isn't it? You know, you, as soon as these things fully become exposed, it's very difficult. That's, that, that's People about really an indictment see what on cockroaches, like. don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it puts cockroaches yeah. in a bad light, really. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, I, hate, I really hate to pick on bugs because we need bugs. I'm not against bugs at all. <laughs> yeah, bug, bugs have their place. Yeah, bugs are all right. <laughs> hey, but that movie Ants is always is one of the best ones that David Icke always points out as to what the reality is. If anybody gets a chance to watch that about the grasshopper yeah. and the yeah, ants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> see, bugs, well, bugs have their Say that and that, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. That's bugs Woody Allen as well, isn't it? Yeah. What? Dawn. Woody Allen. Is he? Is he a voice in it? He's a voice over. Yeah. Yeah. He's a neurotic Jewish aunt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, I'm curious, when you got, if I don't mind me asking you, when you got excommunicated, were you ever brought before a hearing or were you just notified? Oh, no, no, they had a kangaroo court. It was the only public defrocking of a ministry in United Church history. They invited the public in to watch. It was kind of like my public uh, uh, show trial. Um, and they, you know, it was really hilarious, though. You can see that uh, if you, I kind of describe it in Unrepentant, their film, and, and in our I, book, uh, Disrobe of the Emperor. I mean, I've got the gory details in there, but basically they had like four people who they called, but none of them had ever seen me. Like they were, it was total hearsay evidence, and they wouldn't allow me to enter any evidence on my own behalf, like eyewitnesses who had seen me as a minister and all that stuff. It was a complete frame-up, you know. So it, it was really funny, but I kind of blew back on them because then a lot of people started saying, well, why would the church go after this guy, right? What was he uncovering? So, I, you know, I think they shot themselves in the foot, actually. Mm. No yeah, publicity. Think, bad publicity. Yeah, exactly. Just don't spell my yeah, name I think on a lot of people did. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that a couple of times, I must admit. I'm oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> It's good to hear, though, that people heard that, you know, people didn't realize, you know, you've actually been assaulted. You had to go before a church uh, tribunal, practically, you know, kangaroo court. I mean, I, I just want people to realize just how courageous you are. I've, I've heard Kevin uh, quoting before, I don't know if it was on your site, Kevin, or something, saying uh, that um, if you haven't had um, death threats in a week, then uh, yeah. you, you must be doing something wrong. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the hardest thing to actually was was losing my kids, and that's that took a long time to get over. I mean, yeah. we're still, um, my kids are in their 20s now going to college, but you can never make up certain things, you know, and I realize that for parents who lost their kids into these institutions, you can never heal or recover from these things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it just leaves a scar, and I try to explain things to, to Claire and Eleanor now about stuff, and they can understand to a certain point, but... There's just that lack of um, a certain empathy because um, they, you know, they there's a kind of a loyalty issue for them. They don't want to think bad about their mom and about um, the society they were raised in. There's a deep denial, even in the people who we love, mm -hmm. about the stuff that we're talking about. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the hardest thing personally to deal with. And of course, all the I mean, there's this amazing uh, heightened smear campaign on me these days, which is unbelievable. <laughs> Because we're opening the graves, right? So, I mean, all of that is kind of difficult to know. I mean, I try not to take it seriously because I know it's just, you know, uh, a sign of our effectiveness. But No, you've got to keep your work up, man. You've got to keep your work up. I, it's very I, important. I think as well, though, that um, as young adults now, they will have a certain understanding of your work, but right. they won't fully understand it until they're more mature adults. Yep. Um, just, just as... It, it takes maturity to fully understand your your own parents and what they w went through in some way in bringing bringing uh, you up. That when they're older, I think that's when they will get a full understanding of of what happened. For the moment, you know, they they uh, it's too heavy for them to take on too too much at their time of life. And they're grow you know, they've got and, their own lives. They're growing. Yeah. They, they will they'll come to. A They'll come to it one day. Sure. Yeah. That's all true. Yeah. Yeah. What about the rest of your family, Kevin? Are you close with anybody left in your family? No, that I my family pretty much disowned me after this stuff came out. Um, the rest of them, uh, it was very odd. I mean, I I came from a really extended uh, family system, um, and but a lot of them were loyal church people, and they just couldn't accept a lot of this stuff. Uh, like a lot of Canadians, they say, well, that's just not possible for that to have gone on. So I've been, yeah, I was pretty much ostracized within the family. And, you know, the very fact of, uh, well, he hasn't been able to hold down a job in 15 years and he hasn't had regular income. I mean, you know, they, they're the kind of people who that 
that means something, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know. I guess. But I've got a new family. Up with you guys, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're the coolest yeah. uncle ever, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the world is your family now, Kevin. Hey, you right. definitely. You definitely should join the friendship agenda too. We'll have to give you the website. I'll send it to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I'll send it right. to you on Facebook. Definitely jump on board with that. You know, it's a better family anyway because you're choosing who you want to have as your family, which is kind of neat. And you know, it's <laughs> and you know, it's never boring living this kind of life. You know that. Ke Kevin does have some quite interesting uh, deep ancestors, though, don't you, Kevin? I know in your your new book, which uh, I'm not sure when that's coming out, but. Um, that uh, you 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 go quite deep into your ancestry and talk about um, uh, your, yeah. well you go back to Scotland don't you I believe wow. oh well there's Irish Scottish but you know we came uh, our my family were from France we were Huguenots who were chased out by the Catholic Church so I guess you could say this is personal well, runs in the family then yeah <laughs> <laughs> but one of them uh, was Peter Anna he was a, a humanist philosopher in London in the mid 1700s and he was always writing brochures and pamphlets against the, the Anglican Church and attacking the Bible for being, you know, uh, made up and stuff like that. So they eventually tried him for uh, something that's still on the, it, it, it was taken off the books in England, but it's still on the, in the criminal code in Canada. It's called blasphemous libel, where if you criticize the doctrines of Christianity, you can go to jail for two years. And that's, that's hey, yeah. what happened. He was put in the public stocks in Charing Cross when he was 70, and uh, hard labor for a year for writing these pamphlets. So I really feel kind of a, an affinity with Peter, you know, kind of like the same battle 250 years later. I didn't mean to step on you there, but there's five minutes left of the live show. I thought maybe you might want to repeat the name of your books and the name of your new book and your website. I know that's, uh, you know, what is it, hidden hist hidden from history. Dot com and then yeah. I think you got a couple. Why don't, why don't we make sure everybody on the live stream is going to hear all your websites and your books again? Oh sure. Well, um, the main book is hiddennolonger.com. You can download it right online. Um, it's my all my research. Um, hiddennolonger.com. My the book kind of tells. Pardon me. It's a very thick anthology, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think you. A lot have, of work in that. I'll uh, when I come back to England in the spring, uh, hopefully in March or April, then I'll uh, I'll bring copies. Of course, the other book you can get is uh, through uh, OBooks or Amazon.com in England uh, is Unrepentant Disrobing the Emperor, and that came out last year, and that's um, yeah tells the whole story. And then our website's uh, itccs.org and hiddenfromhistory.org. Okay, but uh, I really am trying to get back. Uh, probably March or April, we, we, you see, by then we'll have more of this evidence from these digs, and we want to bring this forensic proof over to Europe uh, and start trying to get an action where Canada's charged with genocide So and these churches. So that's kind of my agenda is to get back to England. Probably mid-March I'm going to try to come in again. So like I say, if I can't get in at Stansted Airport, look for me in a rubber raft off the We will, yeah. <laughs> Um, you send a carrier pigeon so we know you're coming, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, are you so, heading over to um, Italy, to the Vatican as well? Yeah, I, I've, I've been there a couple of times and I've had an invitation to co go back on uh, Easter Sunday, April 8th. They're holding a convergence of victims of, of uh, you know, child abuse and terror by the church. Mm. So that's going to be in Rome on April 8th and, you know, I've got a lot of other invites in Europe, so... Yep, I'll be spending time in the spring and hopefully see all of you guys then. Yeah, yeah you're yeah, always yeah, welcome yeah. here. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite amazing, actually, to think that uh, such a staunch Catholic country like um, Italy, and yet you've got some very good friends and allies there. Oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of support there. We had uh, some good rallies there. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, the, I find that the people in the most heavily Catholic areas are the ones who, who are the best rebels, like in Ireland. You know, you know, Ireland, they, yeah, definitely. They actually didn't renew their their uh, embassy in in Vatican uh, the last time they, and they they told yeah, me right yeah, we yeah had they really up, forced the Irish government yeah didn't they, into in a October they there. sent back their uh, envoy to Rome I believe that's right and they've they've even bringing uh, Enda Kenny the the TSOC in in Dublin said that uh, they're bringing in a law now where a priest can go to jail for five years if he doesn't disclose child abuse even if it's told him in the confessional. Mm. So that's all really promising, you know, and the, we've had yeah. a good network in Ireland with well, Jerry that, and Dublin. Yeah. 
That's yeah. interesting because that means that they're actually contradicting canon law there. That's right. They're taking them on directly. Yeah, oh, taking right. it into their own hands. And also the, the Freeman movement is huge in Ireland, apparently, because yeah. they're, they've taken on the euro, which means they're, they're basically bank, you know, they're triple bankrupt. So um, the yeah. Freeman movement's gathering pace in Ireland big time. So that's all good news on that front. Well, I'm optimistic. I think we're really turning a corner in, in the whole in world history, and I think people are really waking up now, and I, I see it all over. So, yeah, I'll be going to Ireland, too. I'll look forward to it. Cool. Kevin, Kevin, just one more time. Just give out your um, website addresses and all that, because we're going to leave the live stream. But we're going to keep going, because we can do a podcast we, with we us. Can, yeah? We can do a podcast, which is recorded, which will still be available to people if they're listening um, the next day. The people, so and the people who are listening you, on Skype can Can you still... stay with, with us for a bit longer, Kevin? Sure can. Yeah, okay. It, HiddenNoLonger.com, uh, HiddenFromHistory.org, and ITCCS.org. Okay, so we're going to say goodnight to the live stream folks now. And uh, we're going to, going to just play a little music to take us into the last hour of the show. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Sorry about the hiccups earlier, but it's been so great having Kevin on the show Bye. this evening. And um, if, you, if uh, you tune in... Tomorrow, is it? Yeah, tomorrow we've got... Oh, Jay? Tomorrow, well, no, tomorrow the podcast will oh, be the up. Oh, the podcast will show. be available after yeah, the you'll be, you'll be able to hear this next hour on the podcast tomorrow. Also, Jay's got a show coming up tomorrow. And also, um, there's a Santos Bonacci show again on um, Monday. Steve, are you there? Steven. Steve, the same guy? Oh, Jay, do you, want to, do you want to just tell them about your show real quick? It's, uh, oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, uh, Santos Bonacci, where, you know, uh, he teaches the law and uh, the holy science and spiritual dominion. You know, that's his main focus is we need spiritual dominion over all these evil people that are doing all this stuff to us, you know what I mean? Okay, we're going we to have, have to leave it there, Steve. Uh, you've got a show with Santos Bonacci coming up tomorrow, yeah? No, Monday. It's going to be on uh, Monday, Monday, 9 p.m. Eastern. I look forward to it. And that. Uh, on, on Sunday. Hey, Kevin. Hey. We're back. Caroline? Hey, I'm here. And hey, Kevin, I got, I, I got, I got your note. Thanks. Good. Okay. Yeah, just send me your phone number. I'll give you a call. Yeah, I'm doing that now. Sounds good. Okay. Now, how do you say this again? No, it's, it's a Cayman. You, I'm trying to. I'm trying to pronounce the Mohawk. Uh, oh no, that's Irish Gaelic. Uh, Corvine. Oh, no wonder yeah, I couldn't this, figure it out. I'm like, what the heck is this? Okay. Uh, sorry, M H is pronounced kind of with a B sound, but oh. Corvine. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's the Gaelic. Okay. Well, I was gonna say I, I I had some friends who were Dakota too, and I'm like going, trying to figure out what to do with this. <laughs> I thought that was a Mohawk name. Okay, you threw me there. Oh. I'll have to. I'll, I'll get. I'll slip you into the page because I'm over five thousand, but I, it always bounces up between like four nine nine seven and five hundred five thousand eleven. So I'll just. I'll slip you in if you send an invite. Or I think I sent you one. Yeah, I, I accepted it already. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I got you in a couple. I, I, you you were all over the place. You got about fifteen Facebook names, I think. Of course, there's probably a couple faux people out there too. Yeah. Luckily, there's just me. That, that's enough. Ask these guys. I got mm -hmm. Santos uh, Bonacelli coming to uh, talk to. Santos Bonacci. From Australia. Have you heard of Santos Bonacci, Santos. Kevin? He's a jazz player. Remember guys on the, uh, yeah, he plays great music. Yeah, he's hey, great. um. He's an amazing Hey, musician. Carolyn, how yeah. you doing? How's it going? Hey, can anybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Santos, how's it going? Santos? <laughs> Santos isn't here, Steve. Oh, uh, he's not here yet. Okay, he's not here yet. No, no. Is he going to call in? Is he going to escape in with you guys? No. Yeah, it looks like he's uh, uh, trying to call in, right? Really? Really? Yes. That would be great. That would be it. Santos, we think you're great. Call in. Yeah. <laughs> well, he can't, he can't hear us just yet. But... Oh, right, okay. Yeah, Kevin's still with us, yep. Yep. 
invited him. Uh, I, Kevin, I texted uh, him on his line, and he said he's interested, so I, I'm pulling him aboard. Excellent. Fantastic. Excellent, yeah. Um, Kevin, I, I understand think it's that... Like a, um, I, think it's, I think it's 12 o'clock p.m. there, but it's tomorrow there, I believe. I'm not sure. Right. Yeah, oh yeah. It, as it says, 12 is midday over in Melbourne. Yeah. Sorry, Deb, what did you say? Yeah. I was just going to say that um, I understand that you're kind of in some kind of production of a, a new documentary to kind of update on the uh, the um, unrepentant, which That's was right. the, yeah, unrepentant was like an introduction to your story, and of course it's moved on so much in, in, in ten years since that was made. Yeah, there really needs to be an update, so we're working on that right now. I think we're going to call it unrelenting. <laughs> I love it already. Uh, no, just kind of updating everybody and, and just showing how we've really turned the corner on this. And, you know, it just changes in my own thoughts about things. And, you know, things evolve and your perspectives broaden. And so I think that really we need, you need an update. So we're working on that this year. Yeah, that's great because uh, The Unrepentant is an excellent introduction to your work, but it in no way shows the depth that that uh, your your work has gone into now and and how so many of the uh, kind of loose ends have come together and become quite um, apparent for what they were they seemed to be nothing but it's uh, a lot of what you were looking into as um, yeah like I say loose ends in the past are actually quite big events now yeah, it's really, I mean, I often say to people it's just such a great, uh, to be vindicated in this way, it's an encouragement to people to show that you can't have an impact. You just, uh, you know, stay constant and persist with something and you can move mountains. And I think my story is an example of, of that. So I, I just uh, think those hopeful stories are really needed these days, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah for absolutely. Sure, yeah. And I think that even though you're not front page news, which absolutely you ought to be, and the fact that the media in Canada have completely ignored any of these most important findings in Canadian history, they've completely ignored them. Well, I think the fact that you just keep, uh, keep going on, well, and all, you, all you, don't, the you don't need their support. You don't, it's not like you know there, there isn't this need for. Um, recognition in a, in a media sense, it's mm. just... Uh, well, the mainstream media is controlled by them anyway, sort of thing, so yeah. now we have an independent you're, media, we can hear, yeah. the, hear your voice. Oh. Well, Kevin, you're like a kind of magnet which just kind of attracts all the relevant bits to it, so you don't, you don't need the media necessarily because, well, we know what, what they are and we know what they're involved in, but the point is, is that you're bringing together all the most important pieces which are going to Bring bring together something much bigger than and stronger than anything that they have. Right, and, and I think that that's the point that we are our own media now. And um, yeah. I just you, I you know you when you do something yourself, you trust it, and you know it's the truth. Whenever you the, the so-called mainstream come in, they distort it for their own ends. We know that by now, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, yeah. it would appear that the media, the church, and the uh, the monetary system, the banks, are all the same thing. Mm. So, you know, to do it within their framework's never going to work, is it? So, mm. do it for sale. I mean, just keep on doing the action, man. <laughs> it, it's all coming in at an angle when you look at things through the media. And so you're kind of seeing something that's deflected in some way. You're never actually seeing it in the, the true light, face to face. But like you say, Kevin, if you're doing it yourself, it's your own work, you're, you're, you're just uh, face to face with something, you're, you're you're seeing it for what it is, not not with some kind of angle on it. Right. Are we? Have we got someone yeah, coming? Uh, in no. Uh, no. Uh, no. He, uh, he had he had to decline. I guess uh, the difference in time time period or something. He decided yeah. not to. Um, but he, I I told him that next time I. I text him ahead, ahead, a little ahead of time, and, he, and so he give him a little more warning. Okay. Fair uh, that'd be good. 
See, that's what I do. Well, I think it'll do a lot of times pretty good. Knees. Considering how it started. Well, see what I do. Uh, oh, I, 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 why these radio broad, podcasts and ro- broadcasts are going on? I, I go to the, all my my Skype um, contacts and ask them if they'd like to join in, and or if they have any questions, so uh, that that they can come in and uh, ask them or contribute, and uh, it makes for a more interesting show. That's uh, one of the things I do. I, I'm not just sitting still when I'm quiet. <laughs> Good, yeah. yeah, but hey, uh, so so you're doing a, you're conferencing people in, and and so that may be where a bandwidth issue is. Uh, could it, well, I text them, I text them in, then I conference them um, if they want to want to come in, along with having the open lines. Um, yeah, I I need to get a uh, a put you know a a, a T one type. <laughs> well, yeah, we didn't, really, we didn't. You just need to have those folks call in on the that, show. Room yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that, so that's what we did tonight. That Skype problem. Yeah. Is Kevin still there? Yeah. Oh, hey, Kevin. I was gonna say, while well, everybody's taking the ho- the housekeeping stuff together, um, while we've got you still there, and people are gonna be listening to the podcast, guys, we can take care of the housekeeping a little later. But. Uh, you know, when you were dealing with the various uh, tribes, and did the various tribes work together with you, or was it mostly just one tribe? And I was curious if any of these so-called royalty ever contacted you. The who contacted me? The royalty. When you yeah. say so-called ro- royalty, what do you mean by so-called? Do you mean the queen? Well, I don't. Is called I, royalty. Uh, I call them so-called royalty. You know, yeah, because it's so-called royalty because I don't find them very royal. Okay, I get well, what I, I think I call, I call her a witch. She's probably a witch, isn't she? Yeah. Well, a, rep, a reptilian, whatever. But I guess I was curious, did the, did the various yeah, tribes... Yeah, Ox Santos, the meaning of royal. Did, did, did uh, various tribes yeah. work together? Because I know when I was working with the Dakotas, sometimes we had problems with the various tribes actually working together. Yeah, well, at first I started on the West Coast, and a lot of the tribes did work with me, but then when the court settlement started, the native tribes were told, you'll only get money if you stop working with Kevin Annett and stop talking about children who died in these schools. So, they, you know, a lot of the tribal chiefs made a deal with the government and the churches to shut up about this and back off. Um, we wrote to the uh, Buckingham Palace a few times asking them to identify these grave sites near, near the schools, since the queen was the fiduciary officer, right? She's the, where the buck stops on a lot of this. And uh, they never wrote back uh, even when um, an eyewitness identified 10 children who had left, the Queen and uh, Prince Philip took 10 children out of this Kamloops residential school in October 1964. None of these kids were ever seen again. He wrote asking about those missing children. We didn't hear back from them either on that. So, you know, I mean, it's it's been a stonewalling um, response. But on the ground, I mean, this evidence just keeps bubbling up all over the place. Yeah, I was thinking about those 10 specifically. That's what I, you know, I know that even uh, David Icke was talking to Alex Jones about that. And I know you've been on Alex Jones. That was a pretty good uh, interview, by the way. Um, and, and, you know, that struck me as you wondered. It's like, my God, what did they do, take them back and have supper? I mean, these people are really that ghoulish. I mean, they really do, you know, go back to these people. And it wasn't that long ago when they, you know, were, were well, basting in blood and, and eating things. So it's like sometimes you really got to wonder what the heck these people are, what kind of evil they're into. Well, I can give you a little bit more on that. Um, when sure. we brought a psychic, we brought a psychic with us, and actually, um, she's come to the Mohawk site too, and successfully did identify a number of these grave sites. She handled some of the material we found at the site where these kids disappeared, and she said they were definitely sacrificed. Um, when you draw a line along the latitude of Dead Man's Creek, which is where these kids disappeared, uh, where the Queen and Prince Philip took them from. Um, when you draw a line uh, latitude, it, drive, it goes directly through the northern part of the Isle of Wight, which is uh, yeah. I, I identified where it as a spot of child sacrifice in pedophiles. Oh, my God. Yeah. And it happened on October 10, 1964, which numerologically is 10-10-10. 10-10-10, yeah. And there were right. 10 children, seven boys and three girls, you know. So, I mean, I think it's wow. connected, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really, you know, and I know a lot of people don't like to talk about some of this. I just think it's too far out or something. But 
I tell you, the more you do the research, that's what I found in St. Louis. These kids, like I said, we were finding kids either still alive, kept for a long time, and abused. But then also, you know, uh, bodies were just bits and pieces of bone found. And But like you, we couldn't get anybody to, to get really involved in it. So it's like, you know, I know in St. Louis there were all, all kinds of rituals. When my mom was a kid when she was taken to her orphanage. You know, of course, all the kids get molested. It seems like a ritual. There, It doesn't matter who you are or what sex you are, you're going to get attacked. But it seemed like when she was uh, where she lived, they used to come out and they used to call them Nazi buns back then. I, I'm not, it's not German reference. You know what I mean by the Nazi cultists. This was before mm -hmm. and at, before and during the war. You know, guys like uh, Charles Lindbergh was out there and Walker is in George Walker Bush, and all these people yeah. would come out there and they almost had their own version of Bohemian Grove. And she said they would do. What they said back then was fake sacrifices, too, just like Bohemian Grove. So, but God knows what happened if these were really little kids or not. I mean, I, I just there's just really a, a, a thread that's going through this, and it is an international group of these, uh, you know, the tie to the banksters and the international gangsters. It's just, it's just creepy as hell. I mean, these guys are really into ritual stuff. It's not just uh, greed. There's just something else involved here. There is, you know, and they've been doing it for thousands of years. That's right, and the common denominator seems to be they live off the uh, the energy derived from the sacrifice of innocence. And, you know, we found a lot of patterns in the residential school murders of definite cult, cultic uh, signs, uh, rituals. That when Yvonne, the, the psychic, came, uh, the first time she ever touched the stone that I brought from the Brantford School where we're doing the excavations now, she had to drop the stone. She said, I, this, I've never felt such pain off an object. The first thing I saw was children being sacrificed on an altar by guys in red robes. That's the first image she saw at the Brentford Church of England School. So, you know, I mean, it's not surprising. Whoa. Holy shit. Oh, that, that. Kevin hey. is Vicky. Hi. Hi. How when everybody's not speaking, oh. uh, good. your mic when you're not talking, guys. Oh, hey, oh. Kevin, can I? Oh, so, uh, Kevin, so, sorry, I was saying hi. hi. But I was just wondering, with these, um, with these finds that you're getting, with these bones, have you, I, I, you might have said at the beginning I didn't catch it, but uh, have you had any forensic tests to sort of determine cause of death? Yeah, we've, uh, we had two archaeologists examine a number of these bones, and they were possibly identified as coming from the femur or the upper tibia of, of young children about five or six years old. But they are being analyzed in a lab now in a Canadian university, and by Christmas or maybe the New Year we'll have the actual uh, results showing the age, cause of death, you know, a whole report that we're going to release to the world and, um, you know, use that as a springboard to get into more of these excavations. Well, they're going to have to face the light as soon, you know, the more, more evidence that comes up, it's, you know, you've got that short tangible evidence, so, you know, the media will have to take uh, and pay attention at some point, I should imagine. Well, eventually they, they do. They go in and put a spin on it, you know, saying things like, oh, it's mostly animal bones and these kids could have been anybody. You know, they de-emphasize stuff. But what was interesting was the stuff we found in, in connection to these bones. There was a lot of charcoal, which I believe came from the school furnace, where they incinerated a lot of these bodies. Mm -hmm. Buttons and pieces of clothing from things that had been identified as coming from the uniforms of the school. And the bones themselves were cut up in, in longitudinally and sidewise. So they were chopping up the remains as well. Yeah. yeah. To fit them in, yeah. Have you got any um, kind of ballpark date on them, Kevin? Yeah, they were from a period of around World War II, maybe uh, 1930s to 40s, this particular group. But the school went back to 18, the 1830s. It was the oldest group in the country. It was kind of like the prototype for all of the ones that followed. And I understand that you found traces of potash in there as well. Well, that's right. As a matter of fact, um, a woman, when I was on uh, Native American Calling, it's a national uh, radio program in, in the States, Aboriginal radio, um, a woman called Lorna McNaughton called in, and she was a survivor of the school, uh, the Brantford School. And she said that her brother in 1943 said that he witnessed some Canadian soldiers taking a group of Mohawk children out to a ditch about a mile from the school where they were shot, thrown into the ditch. And then even though some of them were still alive, they, uh, they had soil thrown on them and lime and potash, oh, uh, you know, to dissolve the bodies. Well, sure oh, enough... Yeah. In the dig, we've already found traces of potash in among these bones. Mm. Oh, God. My God. And this is just one site <clears throat> that you chose to look at, isn't it? There are many more 
Oh yeah, this um, was people coming up with. Uh, uh, I don't want to say stories because that makes it sound like, you know, it's a made up thing. Mm, these are this is obviously not made up. But yeah, recounts of these events going on. That, that in, was all, all around the country. Yeah, this was found in an area about 50 yards from the school. Only it's a, only a it was a test dig site, four feet by four feet, almost about 18 inches down. And we found it within an hour. So if we found that in such a small area so quickly, you can imagine what's all over the place. You know, yeah. I mean, the death rate was over 50 percent in these schools. Yeah, I know in your film that some of the survivors even say that some of the bodies weren't even buried; they were just covered with leaves and left in the woods. Yeah, eyewitnesses like uh, Harry Wilson, Dennis Talio, other people on the film describe finding partially decomposed bodies. It was a fairly common event. Hmm. That's just awful, yeah. isn't it? <clears throat> Take a it, it, yeah, and it, it all it all kind of comes down to this psychopathic thing again, doesn't it? It's psychopathic, and it's like you say, there's ritual killings involved in this, mm. and this is something that the general public are so alienated from; they have no right. uh, real ability to grasp what's going on there. They 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 just can't compute. It's almost like their brains just won't take it in. Yeah. I think more and more, though, people are beginning to kind of... I think the more they kind of see the yeah. deceptions that their political systems are putting in front of them, the more they are going to be able to accept the, these kind of... Um, this kind of evidence that their, their political leaders are not only uh, completely... Um, devoid of any respect for anyone's financial situations, but for anyone's moral uh, situation or anything. You know, yeah. these people are completely devoid. They will kill their own children, let alone yours. Mm -hmm. So this is the situation that we're in. And the sooner people become aware of this and realize... Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, just, the sooner we can move on. I've just read a passage in a book that suggests that Diana was actually bred to be killed mm -hmm. in this yeah, sacrifice. Well, yeah, yeah. Mm. Her own was... Well, look where she was killed. I mean, where she was killed yeah, was yeah. in some place, you know, in that tunnel, where that tunnel's at. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, and um, also tied to the Kennedy assassination as well, Carl. Yeah, well, I, I, oh, yeah. I, don't get me started on that, guys. You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of. A, I I I I've delved into it so much. I've got I've got some of the uh, Garrison tapes still, the the raw ones that haven't even been made into documentary yet. And mm -hmm. I've did I Judith Baker and I have been we've been going on back and forth since the interview we've had. She's the one who was the mistress of Lee Harvey Oswald, and I've I, I followed that all the way to the U2 to the Gary Powers, and that he wasn't shot down. And then you start tying all these things together. And, and it's tied to all these banksters and these guys that are into, you know, worshiping things. And you were talking about people not wanting to hear it. Fly check it. To me, it's they're in denial. Plus, you know, you're asking people to move off a real comfort zone, and they don't want to think about these kind of things. I mean, I talk about my mom being molested in an orphanage, and, you know, that was just in the uh, 20s and 30s. They don't want to believe that happened. And people in St. Louis did not want to believe that there were living boys being held and being abused on a weekly basis and in St. Louis who the hell wanted to hear that their local media anchor man was you know one of the guys at the uh, local retreat banging a little kid i mean they don't want to hear that you know yeah like that like in was it philly where the the, the penn state oh penn state where the um the coach the, the the sports coach and the the everyone was kind of oh, supporting yeah. this sports coach guy and it was like what the fuck you know this guy is involved in witnessing the the rape of a young boy and you're trying to protect this guy because he didn't report it yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know these, these things it was what kind of mentality is that but you got to think of it it was it done at the sick football world. stadium it was penn state and they're an extremely winning football it, for decades, and that coach is notorious for being a, a wonderful, winning coach. And then you find out that there were all I these. I don't give a shit. <laughs> but see, no, what I'm saying is, they were the rituals were being performed at the stadium. 
you know, were they doing this sort of quid pro quo, making sacrifices, and therefore this guy is succeeding? That's what they believe. You're just saying that, Carolyn, because they you believe support the other team. <laughs> now, whether, they, whether we believe the ritual is working, these people believe it works. That's why they do it right. in these locations. You know, and that's why they brought these kids yeah. to the football stadium and did it there. And then they win, so they kept doing it thinking – they were getting power from doing this. I mean, I said, you know, whether you believe exactly. it or not, they do, you know? Yeah, that's a good point, Caroline. I mean, because that, that whole idea is basic to, to so-called Christian civilization. It goes way back in the Bible. You sacrifice your best. Christ was sacrificed by God for all of us. I mean, the notion that you have to sacrifice the best and that somehow appeases, you know, God. I mean, that's fired right into our blood sacrifice was, you know, rather than grain. Yeah, God, God sent his son and then sacrificed him. I mean, he sacrificed his own child. Is that what these people are trying to reenact when they sacrifice their own children? Well, this goes back to sun, wor sun god worshipping back into Egypt, though. But, I mean, you're right. I, I actually used to tick off a lot of seminarians and make them scratch their heads in St. Louis when my mom used to go drive them around because I used to sit there and say, why in the world is our... I was a, it was a Roman Catholic church, though I'm Ukrainian Catholic and the Greek, right? But I said, why in the hell have we got this, this cross sitting here every day? Or at least we were kids in a parochial school, had a mass every day, and here in front of us, every day, was this huge image of a near-naked man, bleeding, suffering, thorns in his head, I mean, obviously torture. And this is what we looked at every single day in the school to start our day was a mass, looking at this and being told, well, you got to do this because God wanted it. And I used to sit there and think, why in the world do you want to celebrate a God that's not for love? You want a vengeful, angry tyrant brimstone uh, you know um hey go take cain and abel or you know and you got uh, telling abraham to go kill his firstborn child it's like i don't know if that's the guy that sounds to me like that's the that's that's the bl's above not the good guy you know you know what, that, you know what that's like caroline uh, you know when the the mk ultra mind control program came in in the 1950s right at the same time television was introduced um in yep. the early uh, yeah and it was designed to numb the brain and tr so traumatize it to desensitize Americans uh, to violence so that, you know, by the time of the Vietnam War, the kill ratio of the American soldiers pulling the trigger was 90% as opposed to 10% during World War II. And that was deliberately created in American culture and around the world to make people more able to kill and to be sensitized to violence. So it's the same technique, whether it's, you know, traumatizing kids at a young age through violence, through images of Christ on the cross, violent images on television, all of that, it creates a, a numbed brain dead population who are prone to violence. So that's part of a plan. That's not accidental. We all know that, right? And now, of course, right. they have the video games, and they allow oh, yeah. uh, the yeah, troops yeah. to practice these video games where they can just kill people with, without any consequences very easily in very graphic mm -hmm. video games, and they encourage okay. soldiers to take to um, on their R&R &R time to play these games so that when they're back out on the battlefield it just seems like a video game to them that's right well and now they've got these guys killing with drones they're in Nevada and they're killing people exactly. Exactly. even more yeah. like a video game exactly. yeah Colin, good point yeah. yeah what was the point you were going to make about Cain and Abel there um, Azel oh I think I think well I'm saying originally that was like the whole story came with Abel. His blood sacrifice was the payment that God accepted over like grain. You know? so it goes back to that. You know, like blood sacrifice mm -hmm. was payment. You know? And and mm -hmm. just explain a little bit more. What was that? He sacrificed his son. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, 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 not his son. Uh, yeah, Cain and Abel. The brothers. Um, I can't remember which one now. I've had a long day. Uh, uh, <laughs> free man on the land. Seven <laughs> They've hour. been in a, a seven-hour free man on the land um, seminar Marathon, today. Yeah, so, <laughs> and I didn't have any sleep last mm. night. But it's either um, Kevin, Ken, Kevin Ken, no, it's either Cain or Abel. One, one killed the other because one yeah, made the sacrifice which God approved, which was blood, and the other one didn't, which was grain. Uh, so that's the currency that you pay the gods in, I guess. Right. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Jay? Yeah, uh, Cain killed Abel. Okay. Cain killed Abel, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A bit late in the night for this. Yeah. <laughs> at the moment. Is that a sentence in Cain? <laughs> oh, 
I'm probably sure Citizen Kane, all right. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, Rosebud. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember a funny incident when it, my first year in the United Church, I was at a meeting of ministers, and it was during the first Gulf War. And I got up kind of innocently, you know, <laughs> kind of stupidly maybe, and I said, well, why don't we take out a full-page ad in the local newspaper with a picture, a picture of Saddam Hussein and just right beneath it, love your enemy. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe the shit that came down. These ministers were getting up accusing me of being disloyal to Canada, uh, you know, betraying our veterans, uh, you know, yeah, this guy was a Hitler who had to be stopped. And I said, I finally said, look, guys, don't get mad at me. Get mad at Jesus. It's his words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Why, why churches aren't allowed to practice the most basic teachings of Christ because they're agents of the state. You know, they made a deal where uh, they killed the most fundamental spirit of Christ, which is you, you don't use violence in the world. You learn to, to accept people and, uh, and and went through love, not violence, right? So I remember you saying as well that you uh, you went to the church and you told them that you didn't want to have a pension anymore because um, because the teachings of uh, Christ were that you should just uh, you shouldn't plan for the future. you should just mm. uh, you should live a um, uh, not spontaneous, what's the word a uh, well, a moneyless life. Uh, well no uh, what's it like? Trust the natural law. I mean, I've Trust been doing the natural law. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah, mm -hmm. the the the, the um, it will be provided for you on your natural path as it unfolds well, in front uh, of you. Isn't it funny that Jesus was allowed to sort of wander the land telling his stories, but until he turned over the money cart or upset the money lenders sort of thing, he was sort of crucified about three weeks later, wasn't he? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, at the temple, right? Yeah. He fucked for the bankers. He was, yeah, he was a goner. Yeah. That's why he was here. Yeah, the money changed. That's what got him nailed. Occupy the temple, right? Yeah, he got nailed literally. Occupy the temple. <laughs> hey, actually, there's a, a thing called <laughs> OccupyTheVatican.com. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's... I have, yeah. Hey, yeah, they want to go in and, like, urge people to occupy local Catholic church. Well, any churches, you know, just take them over, open them up to the homeless. Mm -hmm. We tried that in Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. And the friends of Freeman in the uh, forum. Yeah. Well, you know, they did try to occupy a church in New York, and they did bring out the police actually to stop them, believe it or not. I think it was St. Patrick's. Really? Yeah. And oh, somebody, I forgot, what, there was some, I think one of the uh, Goldman Sachs guys was uh, <laughs> doing something at the church, so they tried to do something there, and they, they, they were met with a whole phalanx of, of, of local police there, and uh, that people didn't get too far, but that I love the. Wow. Yeah. I think that in uh, Vancouver as well, Kevin. I remember seeing um, some posts on YouTube uh, showing the Occupy the Vatican uh, group yeah. going to right. churches uh, in Canada, uh, but there was some uh, uh, suspicion around that there were uh, agent provocateurs yeah. involved in that. We had to cancel our first one because there was somebody in there sent by the cops who was going to smash up the church a bit to give the cops a chance to arrest all of us. But we uh, we plan for new stuff in the in the new year. We're, we we use more kind of an infiltration tactic where on Sunday morning you don't head in as a group because then the security people can stop you. You just infiltrate one by one, mm -hmm. look like you're going into church, and then you stand up and with your banner and start talking to people right in the middle of the mass. You know, I'm, you can do all sorts of creative things that are fun. You know. <laughs> it really infuriates the shit out of the priest too. <laughs> oh, but it does. Yeah. <laughs> you see that again? You know the old. Uh, just the fact that you suggested this putting Saddam Hussein on the front of the clerical newspaper. It's that. It's that cheeky fun element. <laughs> the humour, inhuman. <laughs> so lacking in the church. Well, you know, I think it was George Bernard Shaw said, said uh, that that when the best way to bring down the powerful is through ridicule, not by confrontation, but just laughing at them. Yeah, he's laughing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, have, especially, all of their power rests on their public image and their 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 alleged authority and power. And when you mock them, they have no defense against that. Yeah. So I think humor is is a really good weapon. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah the emperor is wearing no clothes. The spirit of Hogarth. I mean, yeah. That, that, you know, yeah that, that, you should, they, should the... put Gaddafi on, they should put Gaddafi on a cross 
and just told them um, Rome's getting busy again. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the Roman cult is busy. Sure is, yeah. Hey, guys, I wanted to say, hey, th hey Kevin, uh, this is Steve the Sign Guy from Heaven, man. You're doing a really brave thing against these evil people that uh, kill children, man. Uh, we need to get a bunch of millstones, you know, we got to tie them around their necks and cast them in the bottom of the sea. But, uh, you know, that well, one thing about Christ being crucified, I kind of got away from that bloody stuff, too. And actually, Christ was crucified, but it was in the heavens. It wasn't anything done on earth. And that's even in the, in the book of Hebrews, when they're speaking about the crucifixion, they're speaking figuratively like something done in heaven. And that's what Santos teaches. You know, it's done in the heavens. It's not like done on earth. So that, that there wasn't any uh, bloody Jesus. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the historical Christ, you know, to... Uh, get us involved in their religion so they can control us. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, religion is, is used like that. It's just control more than anything. Yeah, religion was the first form of mind control, wasn't it? Uh, on the mass scale. Yeah. Keep on the pun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember most leaders were... Hey, Bill, uh, guess what, folks? I'm going to get high as heaven, and I'm going to raise a little heaven on those evil people's heads, and maybe a little heaven might grow in their soul. I doubt it, but, you know... At least, uh, like you say, we can have fun doing it, right? Yeah. That's what keeps you going. For sure, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Kevin, you have to, uh, if you just type into Google friendshipagenda.com. Friendship Agenda? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You'll yeah, you got to join, man. Friendship. Have you heard of Freeman before, by the way? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I... I Kind of signed up a while ago on that. I, but also, uh, there's people all over the world who we work with in the freedom movement. Uh huh. Not freedom, freeman, free man. Yeah, yeah. I oh, know. yeah, but not free. I don't mean the freeman, as freeman. in free man on the land. But this is just a guy called Freeman. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah. he's got a lot of friends. He's got a lot of friends. <laughs> that include us. All right, Freeman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I it's a good source of news. But also, uh, we're just talking there about um, Santos Bonacci, the uh, Australian guy. He's quite an interesting guy to have a little look at, um, Kevin. If you Google um, Santos Bonacci and his, look at some of your, his YouTube videos, and uh, he's he's very much um, he 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 used to be a was it a Mormon uh, or a, no. a Jehovah's Witness? A Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witness, Witness. That was it. And he's kind of. Um, Stepped out from the the he's whole. Released himself from those shackles. Yeah, he's re <laughs> yeah he he managed to release himself, and uh, but he he. Um, he gets into it, the ecclesiastical law, canon law. Yeah, he talks about ecclesiastical and canon yeah. law, right. and he also looks at the um, the, the the whole uh, kind of allegory of of religion in its relation to um, star systems and. How um, you know, look at, looking at um, star signs and star systems, and the, the you know how the, the the numbers twelve, the twelve apostles, relate to the twelve signs of the zodiac, and how these things have all been taken out of context and placed in religion and taken literally through the stories and teachings within the Bible. So it's quite, it's very interesting yeah. stuff. He, he also connects the, um, how you interpret it, he also right. connects the law, the law to the, or the courts rather, to a church. That, that's it, how the, So the, it's like yeah. a confessional and you're there to sort of give penance sort of thing and this is why you have to, yeah. you have clerks. You're there to confess, mm, yeah. confess your Declare sins confess when you're your in court. Confess your sins and repent. <laughs> yeah, very interesting stuff. It's, right? it's, it's, no, check that out. It, got, got it's about, the good old uh, inquisition, the good old inquisition. Yeah. 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 I've only got five minutes here. I got to go meet somebody at four our time, but um, so I got to sign off at about five. Okay. Okay. But um, hey, it's it's really, really, really guys, uh, it was really so super. Go, go ahead, Kevin. Give us your last sort of yeah. view. Oh no, I just said it's really great talking to you, and I, I look forward. I really want to. Uh, I'll keep you all posted. Um, I don't know the best way to do it because my Facebook keeps getting taken down all the time. But <laughs> if you send me all your emails, I'll keep you posted about my plans for England. Yeah. Because I'm aiming for mid March to get there. Um, well, we, but then we put some out anyway. Yeah, we put them out anyway. Put, oh, put, join join anyway. the friendship agenda and you can right. sort of. Um, do that. You can do that through there, sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, don't, yeah. don't worry. We'll, we'll keep everyone posted about it. And your work, um, Kevin. please, if you want to come back on, the, on this 
radio show again, please, anytime you like. So just okay, we can arrange that. Then. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, when we get the results from the test of the bones, I should probably yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll schedule well, maybe, it. Maybe in March when you're over as well, we'll just get you live on here. Oh, for sure. I, I'm definitely even going to come down to Brighton. But, um, Fantastic. But um, yeah, after when when those results come through, just send us an email. And we'll schedule a show and do a a special on it. Yeah. Okay. So, well, Kevin, if you want to round things up now, and we'll let you go because we've only got uh, about 15 minutes left on uh, the podcast uh, side of the show here now. So we'll let you go, and then we can just um, ramble on inanely about things. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I just want to thank you all, and uh, it's really good to share all this. And there's such few outlets these days for that that we just got to keep this up and keep sharing the info. And uh, if you could just pass around the websites and try to, uh, if there's a way in our networks that we can somehow um, get a support network going to uh, to help fund my travel, that's always a big impediment for me. I'm, I'm, I'm totally community supported, so I'm always looking for a way to selling the films or the books or raising just the basic travel funds to get around because that's the biggest impediment for me. Um, so it, I just put that out to the universe and uh, okay. also yeah. just, yeah, spread the word. I just really, I love it so much when I come down to hey guys. Definitely. So we'll do it. Hey, that uh, sounds uh, great. Kevin, before you go, uh, high, high five check, can I say something real quick? Kevin, yeah, before you go, uh, I'm, work, I'm working for a new company. We do email uh, broadcasting. We can send out one million, two million emails, five million emails. My boss is uh, actually throwing in a three hundred dollar creative, which is the internet ad. We can put links to ten websites on that uh, creative internet ad, and he's got a, a mailing list of one point three million people who uh, went to Huffington Post to join a group about people who cared about saving the environment. And uh, we've already raised eighty five bucks. It's only costing 240 bucks to send out a million emails and the free creative. And to, to, uh, with that, you can uh, target your audience, you know, uh, and send out like 100,000 a week or 250,000 a week and get the repetition. But, yeah, guys, okay. I sent out a thing to the group on that. Uh, I was wondering what you all might think about that. I wanted some feedback. Me and Herb Guy and Reset, and uh, my boss is donating 10 bucks plus the $300 ad. But, uh yeah, I think it might be a good way to advertise and have 10 links on that. You know, people that want to, like, uh, put their link on there, and it's going to go out to uh, 1 million email addresses. Okay, thanks for that, uh, what do you think? I think a few people are a bit worried about spam on that one. But um, no, if no, anyone's they, well, interested, they look, then uh, hey, look, anyone no, wants I'm, to I'm get actually, I'm actually, check, I'm actually working there. I've been there a week, and uh, I'm learning the business. He had 200 million emails. They're all opt-in permission-based, which means they're not spam. It's spam if it's not opted in, where somebody opted in to receive it. So uh, these are all opt-in permission-based email lists. So it's not going to be spam. So. Cool. <laughs> okay, so there we go. Okay, Kevin, so uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's been great talking to you yeah, again. Good to talk to you all. And, uh, yeah, but we'll talk soon. Take care. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We're, we really enjoy it. Um, hearing everything that you've got to say and uh, and uh, everything. So, thanks very much, Kevin. Good night. So there, there we go. The tape one video once because that was Kevin. Well, well. That was great, wasn't it? Kevin is just an amazing guy. He's got so much to say. And. It's not it, just everything that he says is just not not just <laughs> it's not just um, vague something or other. It's it's yeah, it's good yeah. good work that Kevin's involved in, and we wish him. Yeah, the best it's the life. people that are working under fire. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. you've got people like that. They're going to come yeah. after you. He's an absolute inspiration yeah. to anybody within this movement because. He just keeps on going, you know. Nothing will will get him down. Nothing. Well, I'm not saying nothing gets him down, but I'm just saying that he's he's just he, he's got a great kind of vision and a, a great direction, and you know, he gets knocked down, but he gets up again. <laughs> hey, Steve. Yeah, we all we all got to do that, I guess, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Steve. Congratulations on your uh, trial as well. That's 
Can yeah, you? well done. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. you know. Hey, thanks, guys. It, it was really easy because the guy that I that I hit who was suing me, the mm -hmm. cop showed up, but he didn't show up, so there was no contest. I didn't even have to swear in. It was just I didn't do anything great, man. You know, I, I didn't say yeah. I didn't say I am a sign from heaven, come down from heaven, incarnated into this <laughs> body of flesh, and I'm going to eat your head off, Judge. <laughs> Bite your head yeah. off. There. That was pretty pretty you know good what? advice. I, 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 hey. Yeah, I, I, I had a female judge. She was at my arraignment when I requested a trial jury, and uh, then she said, "Well, she said, uh, uh, do you have insurance?" So I was going to take my wallet out. She said that was okay. She smiled, man. She smiled at me because she remembers me. Because when I ask for a trial jury, they don't like that. See, they know you're trying to get out of it when you ask for a trial jury. But uh, she smiled. I don't know if she was smiling. She was kind of hot, though. What can I tell you? Oh well. How, how hot was she? Yeah, she was. Yeah, she was kind of hot, man. Uh, <laughs> I should have gave her one of my learned secret knowledge and wisdom cards, you know, like uh, yeah. Mark of the Beast exposed. You should have offered uh, her a bump of Set of God to Satan exposed by Santos Bonacci. <laughs> yeah. Hey, baby, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you're one evil bitch. <laughs> and witch, I mean. I say witch, right? Witch, yeah. But that's okay. I love. Hey, that's okay. I love you, honey. Come on, let's go dancing. I'm gonna change your ways today. <laughs> <laughs> just pick up. Guys, just pick up the tab. Yeah. Hey, you know, this email, this, hey, this email broadcasting man. I was talking to Brandon, who did the FOF website. Him and Brett uh -huh. are working on finding spiritual philanthropists. You know, spiritual philanthrop philanthropists that will yeah. give money to projects. You know, to us poor, to us poor enlightened people. It seems like we're all kind of broke almost, but we'll get there one day, right? But, yeah, mm -hmm. so this email broadcasting and sending it out to 1.3 million people who went to the Huffington Post and joined for a cause that because they wanted to save the environment. Those are the kind of people that are like us, I would think. We'd have a, it'd be a great target audience, and it's not spam. Like I tell you, this guy <coughs> owns the list. It's opt-in, opt-in, permission-based which means it's not spam. And uh, this guy's an Irishman I'm working for, Timothy, Len uh, Timothy Linehan. He's a real good, solid businessman. And, uh, you know, I'm learning this business, and uh, it's actually a new career, 59, what can I tell you? But, uh, you know, and the thing is, with social networking groups, you know, like I'm donating 25, Herb Guy's donating 25, he's going to put his website uh, link on the creative. Uh, Reset's donating something, my boss is donating the $300 thing. So, you know, all we need is $240, and we can send out 250000 a week or send out the whole million at once to that uh, email list. Uh, and, uh, you know, we got 85 bucks right now. Wait, so how, do you, how do you how opt in? in? Oh, I'm sorry. What? I didn't mean to talk over your fight. How, how do you opt in to receive the emails? I'm sorry. Say that again, fight check. Uh, this is uh, your name is uh, Debbie, right? I remember? Debbie? <laughs> So how do you I mean, it says Steve Fichek. I just want to make sure I'm being nice. It's Debbie, right? No, it's Fichek. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Forget it. What was that question? How do you opt in to the email? No, well, you know, when you opt into email, when you when you get an email and you uh, click in there, you want to receive their newsletter or something like that. That means you've opted in. Yeah. Right, so this is not a list. Just this is not just a list of email email addresses. This is a list of email addresses where people have opted opted in. Which so what they just send, so they just send you an email, and if you open it, that's you opting in. No, no, no. This is people that have opened emails and they've opted in. And my my boss owns the, that, the that's list. That's what I mean. Yeah, what I'm saying is that this list, one list he's talking about. That my boss owns. He has 200 million email lists, 200 million, and 25 uh, million business to business. You know, and and the the lists are in 900 different categories. But what you know, what so I'm what I'm worried about is that um, like it like say I'm interested in something, then I'll click on it and say yeah, uh, yeah, I'm interested in knowing more about this, and I'll click on it. But if somebody just sends right. me an email and I open it. No, no, that, no, that's the whole thing. You've got to have, you've got to have the right subject line. The subject line is the most important thing. 
And the company I work for, they're experts at doing this. I, I've only been there a week right now. But, you know, this but is, is what they do. They're marketing. What? It, it, I mean, if it's just like market research, you know, where you're just looking for people who have kind of like, you know, uh, similar interests uh, and you just spam <laughs> right. people with similar interests. That, that's no, not really opting in. It, it's, it's not spam. What they do, they've gone to a website and clicked on the thing to get a newsletter. Right, right. Okay. I opted in. The people okay. that own the newsletter have sold, sold the list. Yeah, right. see, this list is from the Huff, this list is from the Huffington Post online, and it was 1.3 million who opted in because they were people who were uh, saving the environment. Okay. Those are probably our kind of people, I would think. You know? So, when you and think, the thing is, like, thank you for clearing that I'll up. Next, uh, I'll explain what. Let me tell you another aspect. Say you have a restaurant in a city. You know, you can target just that city because that's what you want to do. Your restaurants, you want to send out coupons to people in a, a 20 or a 30 mile radius, maybe, depending on, you know. So a person like that that owns a restaurant, if they had a million, they could send like uh, 50,000 uh, a week if there's 50,000 in their demographic. So a million, then they could advertise over and over because repetition is what it's about. So 50,000, that would give them, uh, uh, they could send it out 20 times, which is like uh, half a year. Uh, yeah, like yeah, four months. So, and then it just depends on the target audience and the guy I work for. He knows this business. He's a good, solid Irish businessman. I like this guy. I mean, he's a little bit enlightened. And he, I've been showing him Friends of Freeman website, and he thinks it's a great idea that I'm trying to uh, raise the money through my social network site to uh, so we can send out a million email blasts to bring people to Friends of Freeman, to the Herb Guys site. I want to get a site so I can sell T-shirts and signs and put yeah, Santa's site Herb on there. Yeah, they promote Herb Guys because this hope is you know, yeah, uh, we could put Kevin's link on, on the creative. He'll give me 10 links, 10 links on the creative. So, mm. And those 10 links are going to go out to 1 million email list of people that are probably kind of like us, you know. Mm. Maybe not quite as crazy as us, but they want to save the world <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and even if you only get a 1% return, you know, to that's, check out your site, that's quite a... That's uh, quite a number. That's mm. good. Yeah, that, in fact, Jay, Jay, I don't. Uh, how did you know that? Because that's what we say: a one, a one percent to four percent. It just depends, you know. Well, uh, I'm, you, I'm psychic. Hmm. Well, yeah. And if, if you get if you get one percent back, you're getting a whole bunch. Believe me, one hey, percent of uh, one million yeah. is what, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> but ten thousand. Did I just? Did I just? Did I just? Yeah. A hundred thousand. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Yeah. I turned into something. It turned into an infomercial. Oh, a hundred thousand. Yeah, hundred thousand. One percent. That's a hundred thousand. Yeah. A hundred thousand. One percent. This is a hundred thousand. Oh. A hundred million. Just had our first. But you know, if you. Got to have some mathematicians around here. One hundredth of a million. One million. Yeah, it's ten thousand. Um, it would be. Yeah, ten thousand. That's right. <laughs> ten thousand. That's quite a lot, though, isn't it? Yeah. Crack an A. Yeah, but you know the thing is, if you if you get two percent, that's twenty thousand. I mean, it's guaranteed pretty much one percent, but two percent. You know, if you get more than two percent, if we got if we're if we're targeting the right audience, you know. Mm -hmm. then, then, then the thing is, everybody on their websites, they're going to, you know, it's going to depend which websites the people click on, you know. The, 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 you know so, something like Herb Guy or, Herb guy or something else. Well, if, <laughs> if you're selling, say, like um, organic uh, food, and food and stuff like that would be a good good thing as well. Yeah, the thing, about the, the thing about a crypt. The thing yeah. about a creative, yeah, the, right. thing about a creative ad, the, yeah, the, the thing about a creative ad, the, 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 the thing about a creative, the creative ad, and that's 20% graphics and 80% text. Uh, uh, he said he'll give me that. He has a thing called a landing page, which you can put all the graphics you want on that, but uh, he can't do that because it takes more work. But I'm thinking uh, uh, Brandon, who designed FOF uh, uh, website, uh, he might be able to do a, a creative, I mean, uh, I mean, a, a landing page. 
So we can do our own landing page. We get a whole lot more graphics on there. But uh, so if anyone on Friends of Lehman has a product that they would like to um, be able to get out to a lot more people, then uh, get in touch yeah, with Steve. Yeah. Whatever well, that might yeah, be. That's the Whatever idea. Yeah, that, uh, that might you know, be. We can put a link to Santos' site, a link to Kevin's site. Yeah, people that get in on it doesn't matter, you know, if you can donate or not. I just see everyone's got a, you know, website. You know, we'll just try to get some people on because we need to. You know, I, I like to sell T-shirts and raise money. You know, I got to I like to raise money. Santos has his music to sell. Uh, you know, his music's great, isn't it? I just anyway, love watching him play in the guitar oh, yeah, and his little videos. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's when he's playing the guitar, he's, he's like holding it like he loves it. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. he's Pretty stroking cool. a pussy cat. <laughs> There's a joke there I won't touch. <laughs> I did ask him to try to send some music to us through Friends of Freeman for Wednesday or Saturday.